always we have this strange overlap where you sort of have the opportunity to know a little bit about our world, the other side of the cameras as we try to get these things to work. Um, welcome everybody to yet another edition of the ever popularized, popularizing and everything else, uh, APCH in, in comp. Today is going to be a fascinating chat. Um, just to explain a little bit. Um, we're going to be joined by um, a really good friend of mine called Martin Huckster. Now, Martin has been involved in my work probably for longer than anybody else I know. I can't think of anybody else that goes back further than Martin, right back to 2006 when the first book came out. Um, Martin travelled up to meet me on Merseyside, um, and Martin and I were both fortunate enough to be over to, and to be over in New York. Uh, at the Roosevelt Hotel 10 years ago, where Martin was my master of ceremonies when I spoke on the stage in the ballroom at the um, Roosevelt Hotel. Now, what is fascinating about that particular location is that I only subsequently discovered that was the place where American um, nominees for the Democratic Party announced their nomination for the Democratic Party in the place I was standing. But as I was standing there, I also had this strange recollection of recognizing where I was. And it was only later that I discovered something extremely curious. If you know the movie Wall Street, you'll know there's a very famous speech made by Michael Douglas where he turns around and he says, greed is good. Well, I was literally standing on the actual location where he made that speech, where it was filmed. And I then subsequently discovered that the Roosevelt Hotel has appeared in so many movies over the years. And it is again very, very sad to discover that uh, the Roosevelt Hotel is now going to be closing because of the problems with COVID, which is a massive tragedy because it's a beautiful hotel. It really, really is. Um, that event was amazing. We had around about 300 people there. Uh, Martin did a wonderful opening discussion. And of course, I'd like to take the opportunity here to thank Susan Marie Kowalinski, who was the lady that put up all the money for that event. She paid for Martin and I's flights from the UK. She put us up in the hotel and she paid for, for food for 300 people. There was a full reception afterwards. So it was extraordinary. And then Martin and I afterwards, we, we, uh, we met a few people in the bar and we had a wonderful chat um, with a number of people. Um, uh, and one of them, Tracy Titus, and I hope Tracy will be watching this at some stage. It was her birthday that night but she held back from going to see her friends because she was so fascinated by the things we were discussing. Um, so without further ado, I just, and anyway, in the background as well, Sarah, as always, thank you for your support on this. Now, the thing we're going to be discussing today will be basically movies, but Martin and I, once we get talking, we go, it's like we did with Dr. Alan Roberts last week, we'll go off, in, go off on tangents and we'll go to very, very interesting areas of discussion. And as always, Sarah will join in with her comments and, and pearls of wisdom as well. Um, so without further ado, Martin, welcome to Incon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really glad to be here. Um, I was saying to you obviously before, just the amount of conversations we've had over the years and the amount of times I said you, it would be great if we uh, had this recorded one day. So hopefully it will live up to even, like I say, half the conversations we've previously had. Um, yeah, I, I can still remember literally the day I, I found your first book, which, which happened in quite strange circumstances. Uh, you know, when people always describe, oh, I felt drawn to this. It was literally one of those things. I was walking along um in in crawley high street and kind of walked past a shop and felt the need to double back on myself and walked in and zeroed in on this one book and saw this sort of curious looking book of a guy looking into a mirror looking into a mirror looking into a mirror and i kind of did a few walks around and then i was like yep okay this this, this seems great so i think i read most of that in one sitting but yeah the the adventures uh, and people that that stemmed from people from reading it were, were, were pretty amazing. So I'm very, very glad I did. Um, even, uh, I, I was saying that even, I think about a year ago, I was in a taxi uh, and, and a lot of people ask cab drivers the same tedious questions. So, oh, what time are you getting off tonight? And, uh, oh, I'm busy tonight. I, I try not to do that. Um, so I normally ask cab drivers, like, what are your favorite movies? Or, and if they, you know, are too good for movies, they'll say, <laughs> okay, what, is, what are some of your favorite books? And uh, there was a guy a year ago and he was like, I'm reading a great book at the moment. And I was like, oh, all right, what's, what's that about? Yeah, consciousness, life after death, de deja vu. 
I was like, that sounds familiar. Oh, who's it by? And he was like, oh, it's by, it's by a guy called Anthony Peake. I think I immediately whipped my phone out and sent you a voice message or a video message. It may have been two o'clock in the morning, so you probably didn't see it for a while. Um, but yeah, I, I know the spread that your your work has had. I even remember you telling a story very, very early on to your work about uh, a woman on the underground on, on the subway passing a book in those circumstances as well. Um, you know, that so, yeah. came up only recently, that particular really? story. And I think we mentioned it in one of the earlier broadcasts, you know, and it was extraordinary because she she contacted me and she said she was on a tube station and there was a woman sitting opposite her reading my reading. No, she wasn't reading a book, I think. No, that's right. She was reading a book and she noticed the book cover as everybody does. And then the woman put the book back in her bag, stood up and then deliberately spilled the book onto the floor of the tube. And this this lady then picked up the book. And the woman turned and tried to hand it back. And the woman said, no, that book's for you. You need to read it. And yeah. she and the woman gets off the tube and this woman's sitting there on the train going, what's all that about? And then she started thumbing through it. And as she said in my message, she said, I rarely read books. And she said she was on her way to the BBC to do an interview. Mm. And she said she thumbed through the book and something, her daemon presumably, turned around and said, you've got to read this. So she went back to the phone, the BBC said, I'm not going to be interviewed today. Goes back to her hotel, reads the book. And contact me. And again, you know, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because we have so many of these things happen. And particularly mm -hmm. in those early days, it was quite strange, wasn't it? How we were all being drawn together in this little group, you know. The fact that it even took place on a on, on, an, on a British train where the, <laughs> the, the height of um, repressed quietness is at its worst. You know, people just not wanting to do that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's always drawn me to your work, these little synchronicities and coincidences. and. I, I think I was even saying to you before, just the energy and feeling of being in a certain flow when I've been involved in your work in the past and the people that we've met, the stories we've heard, always fascinated me. And it seems whenever I'm kind of getting involved in these things and having these kind of conversations, uh, life just seems to be a little bit more interesting and magical. Um, so, Anthony, I was going to say, did you want to maybe give a uh, just a really quick um, sort of summary of of your your work and your ideas and concepts just for maybe some of the um, people uh, I might have tuning in today who aren't sort of familiar with your work. Yeah, no, by sure. No, it's probably a good opportunity because there's a lot of people who listen into this now that may not know a great deal about me and what motivates me. Um, I, I suppose rather like Martin, Martin and I are both sociology graduates. And it's one of the things that we, we both got chatting about when we first met was um, the sociological aspects of extraordinary experiences. And when I was at university at Warwick in the early, early to mid 1970s, one of the things that always intrigued me was extraordinary human experiences um, and particularly how people analyze those experiences, what they really mean. Um, and while I was at Warwick, I did uh, a course in the sociology of language and I also did a course on the sociology of religion and, and belief. Mm -hmm. So it really positioned me quite well when I decided after many years of reading, because this is the peculiar thing, all my life I've been a great reader, um, and I'd never realised over the years how my reading was pointing me in a specific direction. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't random. I always thought I picked up books at random, but I've now discovered subsequently that I don't do that. You, sorry to interrupt you, but so do you, was it you, I think it was you that mentioned something called, there was something along the lines of something called a library angel or something, and I, I experienced this same phenomenon when I was at university, when I had 10 minutes left to come up with a, with a dissertation or an essay. I'd, Go on, tell, myself, tell, us, tell us more, Martin. What I, was just, I just find myself magically picking up the right book and opening the right page and, and, and oh, this, this supports my argument mag you know, <laughs> magnificently. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that. Well, well some of the extraordinary things, because I, I had the opportunity, I and mean, I worked as a management consultant and I worked as an executive in an airline and various other organisations over the years, uh, but I came back from doing um, some uh, work in Eastern Europe um, and I had sufficient money to take a year out to, to write a book, and that's effectively what I did. And I suddenly found, again, that... Everything that I'd been reading in the past was giving me links to these things. And it became weird beyond words. I mean, <laughs> you know, coincidences and synchronicities were happening to such an extraordinary level mm -hmm. that, I mean, for instance, I've cited many times the extraordinary experience of um, one day 
I was in Cheltenham visiting my, my brother-in-law's in Cheltenham with my wife, Penny. And Penny, as Martin knows, is very grounded and very down to earth and just doesn't do this kind of stuff. She's She loves her maths and her analysis, you know. But, exactly uh, what you need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly what I need to ground me. But the funny thing was, we, we were in Cheltenham and we'd had a series of really weird coincidences that Penny had witnessed. And she, she just rejects them, as most people do, that are of that ilk. You know, they, they just don't want to know. Even though they see it, they still don't believe it. And we're in this bookshop, and it's a second-hand bookshop, and it's piled high with books and big books everywhere. And she turns around to me, she said, you know, you say that you're being guided to write this book. And I said, yes. And she said, OK, let's test it then, sunshine. And she said, here we have books piled, random everywhere. What book do you need that you're really after at the moment? to 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 analyze your work and i said you know what i'd really like and i had not looked at the books at all and i turned around and said i'd really like a biography william blake and she went oh fuck was the book a book by william blake and it was she she threw it across the room across the bookshop and stormed out she just was so annoyed by it because, of course, it's cognitive dissonance for people like that, isn't it? You know, it's just something they it doesn't equate, so they don't like it. And these coincidences happened. And you mentioned before, didn't you, one of the coincidences you had, mm. which which links into movies. We'll come back to me in a second. But, you know, it was an opportunity to get that in when you mentioned it before. Um, oh, with the, yeah, I mean, I've had many, many, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, acknowledge whether or not we think that fate or destiny or or the landing theme or whatever it is that's driving this is is brave enough to do that to a woman <laughs> when she's trying to make a point. I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, By the way, guys, the other thing you won't know about Martin is he's also a stand-up comedian, so you will actually pick up while. on these observational nuances. It's arguable. It's, it's arguable. It's been a while, but yeah, there's, there's been times. Um, no, the, the, the coincidence is that I've had throughout my life like uh, there's a ton of them and a ton of stories so similar to the ones that you had pouring in uh by the hundreds i know when you was writing uh, doing your work um based on jw dunn's uh an experiment with time you got access to all these amazing stories right that people have had over the years um i mean this is one that sort of stands out for me as kind of um impressive uh but as i'm sure yeah lots of people have had this type of thing happen to them so um, I was with uh, an ex-girlfriend about 10 years ago and we're watching an episode of Lost and um, they're standing by a vending machine and uh, Sawyer, uh, the, the good looking big beast of a man that's got long hair, it's not important to the story by the way, I was standing there with a, a, a blonde lady and I felt this need to just press pause. So I pressed pause, I turned to my girlfriend at the time and I went, Oh, I've got a, a, a cool story about this. So when I was in um, high school um, in Crawley, the, uh, in my sick form, we had a vending machine and there was a, a cool trick that you, you had. So you, you, you'd put the money in, you'd turn the switch off and on, you'd make the selection and then you'd get the chocolate bar that you'd um, selected and then you'd even get your money back. And so we used to just you know do that all day long <laughs> and not have to worry about paying for it and you know not the most amazing story so she probably said something along the lines of yeah cool cool story bro uh, so anyway she she reacted to that accordingly and um i press play and the character so I turns to this lady and almost word for word recites the exact same story i had just said and I appreciate these coincidences happen. Um, I don't know which renowned scientist that sort of argues the opposite of kind of the directions that we tend to go in. Oh, you know, in an infinite universe, blah, blah, blah. It's, 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 it's very likely, but the, the level of eeriness surrounding that moment was just so strange. Was, have you seen this episode before? No, no, I haven't. Um, but yeah, it, that sort of thing happened to me very often. And, increasingly more when, when I was, like I say, in the flow and aligned with the kind of magic that seemed to happen with, with um, you know, with your work and the sort of questions that it asks. So, yeah, 
Because it's funny though, because there's two or three themes there, isn't there? You know, in terms of of Carl Gustav Jung, because of course the library angel was very much a concept of Carl Gustav Jung, the idea that you know you need information and it is just there for you. Mm. But on top of that, we know that uh, Carl Gustav Jung worked with Wolfgang Pauli, the quantum physicist of the Pauli exclusion principle, um, and. Um, Pauli very much worked with him on synchronicity and the idea of synchronicities being significant coincidences. Mm. But of course, the, the, the cynics and the, the skeptics will turn around and say, as you rightly say, it's the law of large numbers. You know, effectively, there's so many things that can possibly happen, particularly in an entwined world, that you're going to spot these coincidences, confirmation bias. Um, but of course, there's confirmation bias and confirmation bias, a whole string of words Mm -hmm. immediately the same time chronologically just yeah. is is beyond understanding because applying that principle and i know that uh, richard wiseman is somebody that uses this professor richard wiseman yes, richard wiseman. <laughs> and the thing is what you have to do there is to say if you applied that rule to the rule of law mm -hmm. in terms of legal cases every case would be thrown out because yeah. you could apply that logic to every single case. Well, the murder coincidentally happened to be carrying a hammer next to the bloodied body of the person. But of course, statistically, that could happen. Therefore, the man's innocent. You know, and it's such a spurious way of thinking. But very much, just very quickly going back, so we just fill in the, the, the pictures. And I, I wrote my first book, Is There Life After Death? Mm. Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We die um, managed to get a really good publisher a publisher that was very keen to publish it and the rest as they say is history that book has now sold i think it's around about seventy five thousand copies worldwide and has been translated into virtually every major european language and a lot of minor european languages and will be going into greek um literally uh, probably in about six to eight weeks time so it's been profoundly popular. And since then, the whole principle I call cheating the ferryman, which is the idea, in effect, that we are in some curious way living within a simulation of our own lives. And like a computer game, the, all the outcomes of every decisions we can make is already programmed into the simulation. And our decisions collapse the wave function of a particular outcome, depending upon the decisions were made. Now, where we're going to be going with this now is that the cheating the ferryman hypothesis, which came out in the first book, I then expanded with a book called The Damon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self. And then over a series of books, and I'm now working on my 12th book, which will be a, a complete rehash of the first book, taking into account all the things I've learned from quantum physicists and various other people over the last 20 years. But it's the movies, it's the way in which, as Martin and I will say, there is there is a, the principle of the Weltgeist and the the you know the the Zeitgeist. The idea that there are these things that we subliminally know are right, that they kind of just are slightly below our perceptions, but we instinctively know they're right. Now, right. if we are all living our lives again, that would be the case. There will be part of us called the daemon that remembers your past lives and it carries these memories and they sleep, they sleep through into our everyday consciousness, what I call the Edelonic consciousness. And this is where movies come in. And this is where these ideas come in that movies carry these things forward. And this has been the theme of Martin and I's discussions for many, many years, which we'll now start digging into. So where do you want to go with movies, my man? Um, well, if we start with what we were talking about earlier, if we start with, with, triangle do you want to just give a really really quick so you're cheating the ferryman um uh idea which was essentially the basis of your first book which as i say the title was changed um you weren't particularly obviously happy about that um that that comes from the uh, greek mythology right the, it does it's the idea to get to the other side it's the idea that in, in in ancient greek myth what would happen is that when the person had died they would place a two coins or a coin under the tongue, either two coins or one coin, either the two coins over the eyes mm. or a coin underneath the tongue. And the, 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 the coin was called an obolus or an oboli, plural. And the reason they were given this was that when the shade, the dead person, found themselves in the land of the dead, they would find themselves next to a river. And then through the mists of the river would come Charon the boatman. And Charon would be expected to be paid an amount of money in order to ferry the person across the river. Either it could be the Acheron or the Styx. Now, the idea was that when that person 
took the paid it they were then taken over to the land of the dead i say you cheat the ferryman i say that you never pay him or you cheat him in another way because the ancient greek myth said you could go across the river go to the other side and then you would be allowed to drink the waters of the lethe if you wished and the water of the, the, the river lethe was the river of forgetting and what it would do is wipe out all your past life memories then you'd allow to be going back into across the the sticks back into the real world in order to live your life again and you would live your life again in a state of forgetting and that state of forgetting facilitated by the waters of the leaf is called amnesis now what happens in some people's lives is that suddenly they will realize that this is not quite right and that's called anamnesis this is all the teachings of plato and plato's cave because this sarah sarah and i were involved in a uh, um, an, an event last year where we recreated plato's cave so the idea is that we sometimes can remember the things we forget that are sublimated yeah. on our past lives so that is basically what i mean by cheating the ferryman yeah i mean it's the re I think I've, a lot of people have had these kind of ideas and these strange feelings from a, from a young age, and it, it, it's almost like having memories from your future. Like people automatically have this um, association and connotation. When you talk about memories, you're talking about something from your past, but there sometimes seems to be these scenarios where you find yourself remembering things that haven't happened yet, that are then confirmed when they do, uh, which is obviously where the, the deja vu aspect come in, which is where you started off with. Um, but I mean, even in this nice. last year, the last year. Oh, I was just going to say, there's a really nice Japanese term. You know how different um, different languages have different unusual words for ideas that we don't necessarily have a word for. Japanese has a word for a premonition of love which I really like because we say love at first sight, but I think premonition of love is actually more accurate because sometimes you meet someone and you, when you eventually end up going out with them, you're like, oh yeah, I sort of knew this was going to happen. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. Absolutely. Because um, funnily enough, just on that, just to butt in slightly, that, that's quite intriguing because um, in my book on J.B. Priestley, um, he discusses something called uh, future, future influencing past or FIPS. And the reason he was fascinated by this was that during the war, he was working for the, the British government because, you know, Priestley did a lot of things during the war and he's on BBC and everything and became the voice of Britain for a time. And while he was there, he kept getting written messages from somebody else that was doing research with him. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he, re and this is exactly what Sarah was saying there, as soon as he received these messages, he just sensed there was something about this woman that was of profound importance to him. And he kept receiving the messages and sending them back. And when they met, it was like, as he said, I knew her. I, she, I knew her from somewhere else. I'd lived my life before and I knew it. And the lady in question was Jaquetta Hawkes who was the, um, the archaeologist who did an awful lot of interesting work in the Middle East. And subsequently, they then ended up marrying. And not only that, but they wrote plays together. And one of the plays they wrote is very intriguing. If anybody's interested in Jungian psychology, the play, it's called uh, the, the, Dragon's Mouth, Dragon, the Dragon's Teeth or The Dragon's Mouth. And it's about four people who are talking to each other. They're, they're, they've been isolated from a ship because there's been a, an outbreak of COVID or whatever on their ship. And they've been isolated in this cave on a little boat. And it's just their discussions. And they're the four types of uh, what Freud would call, what um, uh, Jung would call the four types of individuals. But Priestley was intrigued by this. And this is why a lot of his plays and why he became involved you know, he had actually already discovered the work of um, somebody you mentioned earlier on, J.W. Dunn, mm. and, and wrote a play based upon this. So this, but I love that Japanese term, Sarah. I think that is, sums it up. We all have that sense, don't we? You know that this person's going to be so important to you, and you don't know why. The, um, you, you were saying is that like 80, somewhat 80 definitions of deja vu, and you were saying the common misconception with deja vu is that it's, already happened as opposed to the closer explanation which is already already lived yes uh, yeah. deja, deja vu rather than deja vu yeah. and and i was i was trying to give a sort of a brief description of your work before and i was saying 
an idea I always found quite curious from your your uh, suggestion is that the reason people get less deja vu the older they get is because they're on uh, a new path that they haven't lived uh, before, or at the very least, they haven't lived as frequently before as the you know large amount of times they've done the earlier um, earlier version. So yeah, it's 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 all very overlapping and interesting and. Yeah, the amount of times these concepts have come up. In, in well, this is isn't it? Isn't the classic example of this um, the movie Butterfly Effect? Oh yeah, I hadn't even thought about that one. <laughs> Just writing down a few to remind myself before, but yes, um, quite a quite an act um, towards the end of that movie, <laughs> uh, quite an act of altruism. But um, yeah, no, uh, it's it's the same sort of concepts. Um, they, they pop up everywhere, and um, yeah, I'm sure we'll probably cover the majority of those at some point today <laughs> well the thing is we'd argue wouldn't we that, that they're almost ideal types they're almost mm. Durkheimian ideal types or or Jungian you know sort of archetypes mm -hmm. and archetypes that we just recognize straight away and we, we just it, they resonate with us because we just know it's right and when I was writing the book you know it, as, I, as I've said a few times before and I think Sarah has heard me say me say this a few times that I didn't feel I was writing it, lad. I was excavating it. Yeah. I, I was like I was like Schliemann at the Hill of Hisselik. I was digging out Troy. And as I was discovering things, I wasn't wasn't making them up. Everything just fell into place, you know, and you go, wow. But then again, if I've done it many times before, you know, it's not surprising. I didn't, I, you know, because that's the way it would be, isn't it? You know, the way we met, you know, and how we got on and how you meet. And Sarah and I know this from our group now. We are building this incredibly tight knit group of friends that really back up for each other. We support each other. And we have this inc these incredible discussions and ideas. You know, it's, it's quite wonderful. Well, I've always been very fascinated by the, the idea of um, flow state and, and, like I said, why you are, that's why I, even though I'm not the most confident person in the water, I'm absolutely obsessed with surfing. I just like the idea of just this riding the waves of the universe. But what Sarah was saying before about when you meet somebody and you're like, okay, this, yeah, this feels, yeah, I've, we've done this before. I don't think you, you can't, you can't fake that state. You can't fake that experience. And I think so many times in life, we're either in that natural flow state where things are happening and you're a part of everything. And then there are times when you're going against it, when you're trying to recreate everything. A bizarre, bizarre example I shall give. But, um, you know, when I was uh, when I was younger, I'll make it sound like I was um, born a long, long time ago. I'm hanging on to my 30s by a thread. But... Um, I had great times when I was younger when I used to go out with my friends, like pre-drinking and, and then before we'd all go out and have a great time. And and some of those times were absolutely amazing. And I remember five, ten years later, you're trying to recreate those moments and you just can't. And as I say, a silly example, but you can apply that to so many other areas of life, particularly relationships and meeting people. And when you do try to force things, um, it just doesn't work and 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 it's not even necessarily indifference but i've i've often joked when everything's been going amazingly with people and 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 i'm in that great flow and i've got a period where everything's going magnificently people are like how, what's going on and i'm like you just have to not care and people go like, how do you how do you do that how do you not care and i'm like no you can't fake not caring you actually have to not care because you've somehow kind of immersed yourself into that flow state and it's a real thing i've experienced it so many times in my life um where you just know that you're kind of on you know use the term the right track but you you feel very well aligned with everything it's it's a strange strange phenomenon but you know when you're in the flow and you you certainly know when you're not hundred percent. Sarah, it. would you like to join in with a comment on that? I was just gonna just gonna say in the first instance, that's why I think Tinder doesn't work <laughs> or like any kind of internet dating because there's too much that. <laughs> consideration of like ticking boxes and fulfilling criteria mm -hmm. and not enough of being able to go with the flow. It's like the antithesis of romance. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Because it is sometimes you feel when it feels right. I've used the analogy many times. Well, I don't know if I've used it on here, but I sometimes feel when I'm in that state of perfection, when I feel that everything is right, it's mm -hmm. like standing on the edge of a cliff with your arms outstretched 
knowing that even if you fall, mm -hmm. it's going to work out. And those moments in life, you, you don't get them often. But when you do, it's almost like we're talking about Abraham Maslow when, when you reach self-actualization or as, as people have said, the peak experience, which I always find quite amusing. And the idea that the peak experience is somehow a pun on my name. But the idea, isn't it, that you just feel self-actualized. You just feel that everything is just right for this moment. That you know, reminds me of uh, Babylon 5, Anthony. My favourite captain out of Babylon 5, John P, uh, John Sheridan, uh, mm -hmm. he, he has this quote where he says his dad told him that if he's falling off a cliff anyway, he may as well try to fly. That's the mm -hmm. ultimate flow state. Oh. I reckon. Get that. <laughs> wow, isn't that? But then again, if, if you're in, a, you know, if we are all in this kind of waking dream state, and of course this is just another form of a dream, it's just we haven't woken up from it yet. Mm -hmm. Who's to say that you can't do that? And again, it reminds me, again, bringing in a movie analogy here. And again, if anybody has ever done this, you need to check it out. One of the films we're going to be discussing today, hopefully, well, we're going to discuss so many things. Mm. It's so exciting. But the, the movie Vanilla Sky and the final sequence of Vanilla Sky where David Ames, the Tom Cruise character, decides that he wants to move on. And, you know, he has that beautiful sequence where he's talking to Penelope Cruz and, and it still sells shivers up my spine where he turns around and he says, we will do this again when we are cats. And it just, it's just it's just such line. a beautiful line. And then and then he decides he's going to jump, doesn't he? And he decides that the the psychiatrist is, is a bad thing for him. Mm -hmm. And he has his daemon standing there because his daemon is there with him. The young English actor is his daemon. Because, of course, the daemon keeps coming into the sequence, doesn't he? There's the bit in the bar where the daemon turns around and says that you can control all this. And he turns around and says, shut the F up and everything freezes, you know. But that shows that he's in a simulation. But then he jumps off the roof. And as he's falling, they're playing the wonderful Rios music. One of my favourite bands, the Icelandic band, Rios, And he's falling. Now, what you need to do then, if you have the DVD, start freeze-framing. Because if you start freeze framing, what you will get is a series of still photographs. Yeah. And the still photographs are the life of Cameron Crowe, who was the director. And it's a, it's a near death sequence. And it's a panoramic life review, which is right from my book, It Lad. It's the idea at the final point of death, you have a panoramic life review, but your life stretches out to such an extent that it's a literal minute by minute recreation of your life. And as he's falling, you just see it. And when I first saw that, I thought, extraordinary. And then I realized this is why Tom Cruise wanted the rights to that film. I don't know if you know, but the original film was Open Your Eyes, which was uh, a Maldivar, who was a Spanish director. Mm -hmm. And Tom Cruise was desperate to buy the rights to this. For some reason, he really wanted the rights to this specific movie. And I believe it's because, and I know some people have, and as I do, problems or issues with Scientology as a principle, but I guarantee that this was because there were, there were elements of that film that had Scientology within it in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. And this is what motivated him to follow that. Because we know since then, Tom Cruise has done, was it that the other Eternal Return one where and he's the soldier? Minority Report. And Minority Report, which brings us around to Philip K. Dick, doesn't it? You know, so... Oh, uh, what's the one where he keeps having the same death and he has to get... Oh, the one with... Edge of Tomorrow. I love Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow, yeah. Again, that's it, lad, writ large, isn't it? You know, it's it, lad. Very it is, you know, it, there's, no, there's no other explanation for it. Um, I mean, just before, I'll, I'll jump straight back to Vanilla Sky, but just very quickly, I don't want to lose the, uh, the, the direction that we're going in, but just because of everything that you were discussing before we got onto Vanilla Sky, there was, there was a, a moment that was just so amazing in my own life that I just wanted to, it encapsulates everything we were saying about dating, flow state and this ability where you're able to just like tap in information um it was actually the same ex girlfriend from, from about 10 years ago that i had that experience with the the dialogue about the vending machine and lost and it was in the early stages when you're getting to know somebody and you do kind of feel that kind of magic and i don't know why but i was just in that amazing state where the, the, you could call it just pure blind luck or arrogance was just shooting through the roof but i felt so connected with everything we were having a conversation and um, I think she was mentioning about the fact that she used to have a cat and I don't know what, I don't even, I didn't even feel myself saying the words. I felt like they just came out of my mouth. I just went, I bet you I could guess what your cat's name was. 
And, and she went, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> and I don't know why it was based on an old episode of Blossom where Jerry Lawrence was like uh, giving, uh, consoling this kid because his, uh, his cat had died and he told him to buy another one. And I don't know why, I just knew I'd be right. I just went, your, your, your cat was called Snuggles. And she looked at me and went, how the hell did you just do that? And I, it was so weird. It was one of those moments where I knew I was going to be right before it happened. And I had such pure um, just awareness and assurance that I was going to be right. It was so bizarre. I've had those kind of conversations before where I'm, you barely even listen. You're just, you're just saying what you're being told to say. It's very, very strange. And it does feel that kind of right side demonic where it isn't even the conscious you. It's somebody else going, oh, yeah, 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 this, 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 and this. But, but yeah, I just had to get that in because it was so powerful. And I, I still remember that moment because I've, I've had several moments like that. And it, it, it's very, very strange. But, but yes, Vanilla Sky, good place to start. And um, yeah, uh, very similar to a lot of other movies and, and has... Those very similar. That was a very powerful moment in that scene where where they pause everything, like you said, when you realise the, the, the simulation, uh, which <laughs> the simulation idea could go off in a thousand different directions. We should probably just juggle one narrative at a time at the moment. Maybe not too many because we'll lose track. But yes, absolutely amazing. Because I always like in Vanilla Sky one. I it's called Vanilla Sky, and it's the same segway point isn't it where he gets and he's staggered on the street and again the symbolism of the mask is interesting isn't it because of course tom cruise and eyes wide shut yeah. you know there was the similar themes uh was it nick roig did that was it nick roig eyes wide shut um oh, it was stanley kubrick stanley yeah. kubrick wasn't it sorry silly me of course it was kubrick but you know he's staggering along the road and then he falls and then every other sequence from then onwards the sky is vanilla mm -hmm. and you don't spot that and you think how clever and of course, all the time in the, in the, in the movie, isn't he? He's wandering around and he's saying, oh, living the dream. I'm living the dream. And he is living the dream. That's exactly what he's doing. He's living his life again in a dream sequence. Um, and you see all the clues there. If, if, in fact, it's a great movie, isn't it, for actually having it on DVD because you can freeze frame the number plate of his car. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there's just so many brilliant things that just play with your mind in that movie and what came out in 1999 i think it came out before um the matrix i think i'm right in saying because i know the, a lot of movies came out about that time um but clearly with 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 a maldivar you know he'd done the the, the the movie about two or three years previous to that so clearly you know he was way ahead of his time in terms of that movie i was wondering if those kind of themes are a bit 90s or you know not exclusively 90s but that perhaps they aren't especially in vogue at the moment because they're always my kind of favorite films and uh, i haven't been drawn to go to the cinema for about a decade because mm. those kinds of films aren't really popular at the moment <laughs> I don't mean there's any type of, I think in the last two or three years, films generally 99% of the time don't exist anymore because, you know, Netflix and Prime actors, you know, why would you do a 90 minute movie when you can do a six season uh, character development extravaganza? So, yeah, I mean, as a, as a huge movie buff, I'm very sad to agree. Like, I don't think. But, but isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't, that, in, isn't that interesting, though, that we think that these things don't appear, but they do. Mm. They subtly appear. For instance, I'll give an example, and it's going to be something I'm going to be expanding on in my new book because it was only recently I remembered this. Game of Thrones, Hoda. If you remember, Hoda can't speak, and all he does is say Hoda, Hoda all the time, and that becomes his name. And then you get to the classic sequence when the, the castle is being attacked, and what happens is Hoda holds, holds himself against the door to protect people. And what he's actually saying is, hold the door, hold the door. And they're the last words he uses before he's killed. Mm -hmm. And again, this whirls straight back to, you know, my example of my own proof of cheating the ferryman. You know, I've cited this many times, but it's a golden opportunity to mention it here. I was driving. I have um, a, a device it was called an Arcos, uh, and it, for the time, it was a, an ultimate music machine. Oh, yes. You know, I had about 16,000 different tracks on it. 
Okay, so 16,000 tracks on this. Now, I was a divisional human resources manager for Nuffield Hospitals, and I had responsibility for about 14 hospitals across the north of England. So I was razzing around in my neat little uh, Mazda RX-8 sports car. It was my company car. It was cool to have a company car like that. <laughs> Don't ever do that, by the way. It cost me a fortune in tax. But anyway, I'm razzing around the north of England, dropping into hospitals, solving problems, drawing on their own, going somewhere else. I was positioning one evening for um, the hospital uh, in Chester. Now, roll back of many years before, 1988, 89, I go into a music store and I buy a CD because music is very important to me. And I'm also given or paid 50p for another CD, which has on it a load of samples, sample tracks for new albums that were coming out on that record label. So I go home and I get home, my ex-wife and I, I sit at home and I, on that Saturday, put the CD on and I'm playing it. Penny is out, uh, sorry, Jenny. Jenny is outside doing her kitchen stuff and I'm listening to the typical male. It's terrible, isn't it? And um, I'm listening to it and the second or third track comes on and it's a track called Round of Blues by a singer-songwriter called Sean Colvin. The minute I hear that, I go, that's my death song. And I decide, I call, Call Jenny in and I say, we need to next week go out and I want my will changed. And all the women in my life always give me this look. It's really strange. All through my life, it's the same look of, oh, my God. And she said, why? And I said, because something I need it changed. So we went in and my will was changed uh, and everything else. And I then roll forward again all those years, have this this player, 16,000 tracks on it. I always have it on random play. Even now, even with my phone, I have it on random play in the car and I listen. One in 16,000 chances of a track coming up. Driving along towards Mil Milne Row on the M62, a foggy November night, terrible conditions. Driving down. As I'm driving down, one track ends, the next track starts. It's Round of Blues off the album Fat City. The only time it had ever come on. And I suddenly swung back and I thought, this is my death song. Suddenly, I found my left arm grab the steering wheel and pull me into the slow lane. As I did so, the lorry in front was carrying crash barriers. And the crash barriers bounced off the back of the lorry and bounced along the road. They would have landed on my car. I would have been killed. I argue that the reason that had become my death song was that Last time I lived, I died that day. And that song was the thing that was playing in my ears the moment I died. That, to me, was absolute proof of cheating the front. If ever I needed proof that I've lived this life before. So all my life from now, I didn't happen last time. Mm -hmm. I died that day. And the rest is so meeting you and meeting everybody else is in this extension of my life in one way or another. So I'm in this kind of part of the simulation that I may have visited in other times, but not in others. I so don't know, um, not, not the most popular uh, character to use as an example, but uh, Louis C.K., when he had his own, his, his show Louis, there's a great scene um, with a woman where they're standing on the edge of a, a building. And he would say, most people get scared, not because they, they don't want to fall or they don't want to jump, but because there's a part of them that actually does. And I think there's so much, I have that feeling sometimes if, you know, when you're walking along in a mall and you're on like a second or a third level and you get near the edge, I feel like the reason you get that kind of ooh, feeling is because there's a, there's a version of you somewhere in the multiverse that is just like, whatever, and just jumps over the edge. So there is an existence of it. And what you're feeling is the presence of death, exactly as you just described. And I think it's a real thing. And I think if it wasn't, you wouldn't have such a, you could argue, yes, of course, it's survival and, and instincts and, and yes, just keeping yourself alive. But some of those feelings sometimes, yeah, they're, they're hard to articulate and they're hard to encapsulate. But yes, I, I completely understand what you're saying there. Sarah, again, do you want to come in on that? This reminds me a lot of Star Trek because Star Trek has a lot of these timeline episodes and I'm a massive Trekkie. So obviously that's one of the programs that I enjoy where you still get a bit of that in it actually the last episode of discovery um there one of the characters goes into the mirror universe and dies in the mirror of universe and then is reborn in the alternate timeline so I think Star Trek is one of the few 
few kind of franchises where you still get that storyline very regularly and in that kind of classic sense as well. Like, I, I think you're right. Those themes are still present on Netflix. You had that Russian doll program. You had, yeah. um, what was that one called? The OA. Mm. I loved oh, yeah. that. <laughs> um, Amazing. So you do get it every now and again. But when I was a kid, it was, it was like a secret between TV films and me mm. that this was the stuff that I was into. And, if, you know, I used to watch Twin Peaks on my own and I was into weird stuff and uh, especially anything that dealt with um life after death like I was writing to you about brainstorm I loved mm -hmm. brainstorm and my because I was so into dreams when I was a kid I've just written an article actually about how I think that dreams would have influenced early religious thought and that because people would have seen people that had died in their dreams, they would believe that there was a form of life after death and that would have encouraged those kind of ideas. Yeah. So um, brainstorm is great because they've created a machine that records your thoughts and records your memories. And so it's accidentally left on while someone dies on it. And so someone watches um, the experience of death and what happens when you die and they start to see the life review. Mm, I'd love to get if we'll, hopefully we well maybe now or at some point when we get on to talking about two movies I one in particular I love which isn't necessarily massively Atlantean but in many ways it has little glimpses of that and that's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind yeah um, and then a very similar Mike, is movie it Daldry? Is that Michael, Michael Daldry? Gondry Gondry uh, yeah. and he made a very similar movie actually um, and it's all about lucid dreaming called The Science of Sleep yeah absolutely. Uh, which is fantastic and oh, yeah and 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 waking life which should be a huge huge part of the discussion i would imagine that we have today but it's just capturing those little those little they're just so intangible they're so hard to describe those dreams you had when you were younger where you just felt so moved like something amazing had happened and you've been given some sort of clues about something from either your your present or your past and you just feel it's a it's just a feeling that is so hard to describe and then later on in life it's anchored at a different time and it, and it takes you back it's um it's amazing uh, and that feeling of loss you have sorry sarah i was just gonna say i wonder if you miss we're missing um that full integrated version of ourselves by not remembering our dreams. Like Rebecca mm. Sharrett, who we've talked about a lot, who we're going to interview, has highly superior autobiographical memory. And I think the key to that is in the way that someone like that remembers their dreams, which is absolutely with a continu continuity with their waking life. So they remember everything that they've dreamed. They feel present within their dreams all the time. And I think that that's the kind of overview that most people don't get the opportunity to have because we don't remember our dreams very much as oh, yeah. that's a good point yeah i started to do um uh the exercise of, of well i was starting to try and get better sleep again about six seven months ago and i started uh keeping a dream journal in the morning and i was i was listening to sort of lucid dream uh you know tracks in the evening before going to bed and and i found that just regularly doing that in the morning it made such a difference um even in just when i was awake and enjoying the moment so much more um an extremely good friend of mine uh, a girl called nor um, we were we were hanging out in london uh, a week or two after i'd started doing this and i just recall having this sort of hour or two we had where we were just i just felt so happy and connected in a way where i felt so much more awake and alive than I had in a very, very long time. And I know there's a lot of theory to suggest that the, the more you pay attention to your dreams and the more you do document them, it, it kind of almost allows you to tell the difference of when you're awake and when you're not. And, and this is, yeah, hence a big theme of Waking Life, the movie, isn't it? It's uh, the fact that we're all just kind of sleepwalking through our lives. It is, of course, everything. Waking Life. I think that segues perfectly into Waking Life, doesn't it? You know, the idea of, is it Wig Bradley Wiggins or uh, uh, oh, it's Richard whatever Linklater. the guy is? He's a Facebook friend of mine. Richard Linklater did no, it. No, Linklater did it, but it's more the, Linklater did it, but oh, it's the yeah, actor it's, that plays the role of oh, the young man that's right. wandering around. Yeah, Bradley, yeah, Bradley, the younger boy. W Wagley Wiggins or something. And he is a Facebook friend oh, of mine, yeah. if you oh, look yeah. down the list. Oh, so, fantastic. And, of course, that movie is so great because it's talking heads, but it's it's intriguing, isn't it? Because he wants to know how, where is he, how does he wake up? Is he in a dream? Does he wake up? And of course, what we need to do now, Martin, is, and it's you that brought this to my attention, that incredible sequence 
was it Juliet Delpy and um, Ethan, e Ethan Hawke, Hawk, the discussion where they discuss in bed? Yes. So Richard Linklater, who's made a, a huge amount of my favourite movies, are Richard Linklater, you know, Dazed and Confused, and then all three of the Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight trilogy, uh, Waking Life, Boyhood, and, and many others. Um, those two characters are in one of the one of the best kind of, I mean, it's not even a rom com, just dialogue driven uh, movies. It's ever. beautiful. And it's beautiful. It's what we were saying about meeting the right person. Oh, I can't bear those films. That movie. They are like a total you know, bugbear for me. Really? I hate them. I absolutely no. <laughs> I don't know what to say right now. <laughs> well, no, that's I've good. Had of, I've had a lot of arguments well, already about, about this. <laughs> no, well, I, I, I happen to love them. I mean, it's just, I mean, there is something a little bit cliche about them, but I just think they're so brilliantly, brilliantly well done. And Richard Linklater's had a constant connection with Ethan Hawke. As I say, they did Boyhood over a very long period of time. But oh, the, the wasn't point that was those characters. Boyhood, what a movie. Yeah, but the, the characters have been, you know, over three movies over a period, I think it was like seven years, seven years and seven years, or it might have been nine, nine and nine. And uh, mm. the Wake and Life scene was in between. And it was, it had that otherworldly feeling and, and it touched on so many ideas. The first was, the idea about reincarnation and, and reincarnation is one of those tricky ones that comes in with a lot of the work that you talk about and a lot of similar ideas and that it's a nice idea. Uh, I think Julie Delpy says something along the lines of it's just a nice poetic expression about, you know, um, evolution and instincts and, and, you know, millions of years of, of, of knowledge and, and memory. And that's where instincts come from. Uh, the problem with reincarnation is that, it you know, the look at the, uh, the size of the population versus the amount of people that are born and die, and it doesn't quite make any sense. Um, mm. But there's some fantastic moments in that one scene. Uh, in particular, Ethan Hawke's talking about, um, yes, uh, awareness and information and how we all kind of channel into it, uh, you know, in a kind of Tesla type way. We are talking about crossword puzzles and how they isolated a series of people um, and got them to do crossword puzzles that had been already completed by a bunch of people you know they were days old and they found out that once the answers were already out there for people that they were able to kind of somehow tap into them a little bit easier even though they didn't necessarily know it's like we're all sort of channeling our awareness and experiences telepathically it, it, it's got so many ideas but the end of that movie is um you know a, a huge a uh, huge moment where i think it's the richard linglater characters talking about the book of acts moment with philip k dick mm. uh and, and the story that happens there um but yeah it's, it's just a beautiful movie for kind of describing the intangible moments the moments that are so hard to describe just that eerie feeling that you you can somehow apply to your life even though the the thing being described comes from somebody else's that, that you know obviously is very very different yeah it, it does seem i mean linklater has a lot of very interesting themes, I think, in his work. Um, in in terms of um, uh, the uh, the trilogy, um, it reminds me very much. One of my favourite films of all time is uh, the Aviator's Wife, oh. which was a French art film that came out in the early nineteen eighties, and it's just a beautiful. It's Eric Roma, and Eric Roma did a whole series of these incredible vignettes type French and very French. Nothing really happens like the Green Ray is another one. Uh, uh, Claire's Knee, I think, was another one. And they all, nothing really happens, but there's this beautiful kind of languid Frenchness about them that nothing really happens. And people talk all the time. And then the, it doesn't end. You know, it just, the film ends. That's like why I don't like these films. Nothing happens and people just talk all the time. I, I, that's why I don't like that. that. It's like the worst sort of film ever. I like really great things happening and a lot of uh, exciting well no it's not like I like car chases or anything but I prefer um visuals to dialogue I think that's mm. fair enough everybody's got their own subjective take you want to stay away from my favorite movie then Hurley Burley which is uh, kind of alcohol drug dialogue fueled nonsense for grown-ups it's a bit like <laughs> A bit like Catcher in the Rye on speed, um, but, but yeah, um, no, no, that's that's fair enough. I mean, I, could, I I certainly understand that. There's there's certain moments and parts of that movie that you know would certainly be 
uh, cliche, definitely by today's standards. But when you look back at when it was made, it was, it was just very, very nicely done. Um, but yeah, R Richard Linklater, he, he's very, very, very talented with dialogue in that you can tell he gets these sorts of themes. And I completely agree with you, Anthony. I think it would be amazing if there was a way to get hold of him. I think it was about 10, 15 years ago, just when I probably just started being involved in your work. I was a member of a, a, a Kevin's, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Am I back? You are, yes. I do sincerely apologise about that. I'm, as I said, I've had to come into work <laughs> and, and Zoom gave me a very confusing option, which was to completely ignore that the call was coming in or just abandon my current situation and take that. So obviously... Well, you're on a flow there, so you were talking yeah, about I was on a flow. Link so later. We were talking about Link later. Um, had I actually revealed the uh, point I was making? No, 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 no. No idea then. Completely lost. Uh, unfortunately, let me try and retrace my thoughts. Um, so what it was, was when you were in the States? Was it when you were in the States and you that met people so in New I, 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 Thank you very much for the prompts. I was, um, I was um, uh, a regular member on a, a Kevin Smith message board, the filmmaker Kevin Smith. There was some amazing um, people on that board, very good friends I still have today. And somebody I know on there went to college uh, university with uh it was actually Rink, richard Linklater or, or one of the main writers that he'd worked with and i think this was just when i discovered your work and i was desperately saying to them oh you know you need to you need to see my friend's work you need to read my friend's book i think he'd find it fascinating uh, but obviously it's one of those unfortunate links that never actually panned out but um there, there are so maybe many we'll people. maybe maybe we'll link later nice well played <laughs> sorry Sorry. You've been waiting oh, all day to use that one, haven't you? <laughs> well, as long as you can embarrassing. Back, roll your eyes after you do that, it's somehow allowed. Um, it's an old man joke. It's a dad joke, isn't it? It is a dad joke. I was about to say, if, is it, I'm not sure if you have any children, but I was about to say, because if you don't, you, you, you're, you're, you're hiding it well with that dad joke. Yeah, oh, there we go. Um, but yeah, um, interesting that you're, you're not a big fan of it. And so not a, not a fan of the dialogue movies, but at the same time, not you know, all about main, mainstream car chases. I understand that. That's that's understandable, actually, especially if you're kind of enjoying that era of movies beforehand. Um, I've noticed that it's a lot of men really love Richard Linklater films and women don't seem to go on about it so much, but it's the men in my life that I have fallen out with over <laughs> Richard Linklater films. I must remember that. And what are those other ones? Mall rats, that kind of thing as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Marty to mention mole rats, actually. I'm not a fan of the, I'm not a huge, I've got to be careful now. I'm not a huge, I'm not, I'm not, a, not a massive, well, I'm not a particularly big fan of the movie mole rats. I just met a lot of very, very cool people from uh, the director. Mm. I was on a message board of, of the director from a lot of similar sort of movies, um, Dogma and many others. But no, that's not, it's not an area of my particular um favorite movies I'd, I'd be i'd be referencing many others like wonder boys and like i say eternal sunshine of the spotless mind and, yeah because when you mentioned internal sunshine of the spotless mind i was reminded you know the whole idea of wiping out memories because they're so negative and being able to do that you know i wish in our lives sometimes we could do that you know to expunge those memories that affect us and they come back at us all the time and couldn't it be wonderful if you could just wipe that out of your mind in some way so it didn't play with your mind no, I think that's part of growing up. You've got to just uh, okay. integrate those things and evolve with those things. And uh, I do like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That's one we can agree on. <laughs> Good. I mean, Good. The, I completely agree. And that's the, the big message of that movie is that you can't, like, change and leapfrog experience. You have to go through it. Uh, the only way out is through sort of thing. And one of the key moments of that movie is when... Um, is it Elijah Wood's character <laughs> who's kind of stealing the identity of, of, of Jim Carrey and trying to seduce his girlfriend with his own words and, and stuff. And she just has that moment when she's lying there and that feeling where she was like, I feel that this, this is weird. This doesn't feel right. He, he, it's the same, same location, same, you know, same dialogue, same everything, but different people. And, and she's like, no, this doesn't feel right. And, and, 
there's something really, really, you know, quite poignant about that is that you can't, like I say, you can't fake experiences that are genuine and, and feel right. And, and there's something so great about that movie. I love, I love the scene where he's trying to wake himself up and, and he does it temporarily. And he's like, oh, actually wait for a second. Because uh, I, I think I've had those moments where you're in between being awake and, and asleep and you, it's, it's very tied into uh, sleep paralysis, which I find fascinating, especially mm. with the work that you've done. And I think there's a, I don't know if it, how, how many other people, you obviously far better versed with this area, but there's, there's clearly, in my opinion, a very strong link between sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming. And to me, it kind of feels like lucid dreaming is when you just relax and go with it and let go and feel good. And sleep paralysis is when you're like very, very much not doing that. The complete opposite. Where, you know, you're well, isn't this, Sarah, that. what Samantha Lee Treasure is going to be talking yeah, about tomorrow? Um, for my lecture club, the Explorers Club, we're talking to Samantha tomorrow about sleep paralysis. My, okay. I haven't really had very many experiences of, of sleep paralysis, but I haven't really had nightmares very much either. Okay. Um, and I think that my experience of doing wake-induced lucid dreaming, where you you basically kind of lie on your back and wheel yourself into a dream, trying to maintain your awareness of it as you're going, um, is that uh, you reach this point of paralysis at some stage. And depending upon how you feel about the dream you're entering, mm -hmm. those things manifest into dream content. So if you're a bit scared, you give your kind of mental energy to the scary things until they become overwhelming and mm. it's this it's a similar thing with nightmares as well i mean the one thing i would say about sleep paralysis is it's more likely to occur um you're more likely to find yourself in your actual surroundings like you're more likely to see that you're in your bedroom and things like that than in an mm. actual dream state yeah so there is that difference but if you can if you can kind of um create a sleep paralysis state and feel positive and happy about it then i think that that's a good entry point for a lucid dream Mm -hmm. it's that pull on your brain i always found this area so fascinating is it, it's almost so yeah what you were saying about like the environment in your room so when i've had sleep paralysis it's like if i fell asleep now i would see everything that i could see with my eyes open but i see it while i'm asleep and then you realize you can't move because you're still asleep and it's almost like you're trying to shift your your energy and your soul back into your body and you feel this tremendous pull here like really so like really big strain here and the area that I, I remember you writing about, uh, Tony, I don't know if it was in your first book. It was definitely one of your early books. And you were saying about the, the headboard thing. And the, uh, the, what it means is some form of precognition or time travel or some, not time travel, it's a, a bad, ex bad use of words, but something very strange is going on in the way that when you're in that in-between state, the hypnagogic state, for example, if you're falling asleep in the afternoon in your, in your home and it's like when you're with a partner and watching a movie, falling asleep early and then you should, much to their annoyance, and, and you, you have that kind of, oh, drifting off. Especially and you if you watch a film. And, <laughs> yeah, of course, exactly. <laughs> and you have that kind of shake where you kind of, oh. It's God. called a myclonic jerk, by the way, if you wanted to know. That's oh, yeah, the term. I love Jerks. Yeah, yeah. we need to have more myclonic jerks. We we'll do. That, that needs to be on a bumper sticker. Bring back the. Myclonic they bring back the myclonic <laughs> jerk. In my dream, I'm always tripping on a curb. That's when I get it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's 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 so strange because somebody in your home would bang a cupboard at the exact moment in your dream when there's like some sort of impact. Now, one of two things, as you said, Tony, I do remember it has to be happening. Either. Your, your brain's able to scan forward and know that that bang's about to happen and create a storyline that fits, or the bang happens as some sort of time dilation where you're able to actually do the same sort of thing. Either way, it's kind of fascinating how that kind of synchronicity, I know that's when your mind's eyes, apparently it's most open and you're most mm. aware and perceptive, but it's, it's a really fascinating state. I've always found that really, really... The, the case in question uh, that I cited was a guy called Alfred Mowry. Uh -huh. And Alfred Mowry had this, when he was very young, and I think it's significant that he was in, he had a heavy fever. And I think fevers are probably related here in some way to facilitating mm. altered states of consciousness. Uh, as I cite in one of my other books in terms of memory and everything else. But with this particular case, he was in he was in bed and he was having a dream and he dreamt he was involved in the French Revolution. 
and he dreamt that he was one of the members of the assembly and he he fell foul of Robespierre and Marat and the various other people within the French revolutionary cadre and he goes to a whole trial and in the trial he defends himself makes his own speech he then is condemned to death and in the dream he's taken through the streets of Paris in a tumbrel and he's taken into the place de la Bastille and then the, there's the uh, the guillotine in front of him. He makes this huge speech in front of the crowd, raises the crowd up, puts his head down to the guillotine as the, the back part of his bed head fell onto the back of his neck. Mm -hmm. Now, the question here is he'd created or something had created a whole scenario back created in time to accommodate something that was about to happen in his future. Because that's the only explanation for that, isn't it? It had to be in some way, either his time had dilated, but even that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So clearly what we have here, and of course, it moves right back to a film I wanted to mention before, Inception. Because don't we have that fascinating sequence in Inception where the, 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 the bus is falling off the bridge mm -hmm. yeah. and it's falling down and time dilates again and again and again and again and this is central to my cheating the ferryman hypothesis because i argue at the point of death there's the release of of either entheogens endogenous dmt whatever we want to call it yeah. glutamate flood mm -hmm. and it slows down your perception of time therefore the final second of your life is like a hypnagogic state mm -hmm. that you can you can as we've had we have these dreams before we wake up before the alarm wakes up yeah that, we have a whole life dream. And Sarah and I were discussing this. And for instance, in the last show, we were discussing about the um, Star Trek episode where Picard lives a whole life. Mm -hmm. Then we have turn left, don't we? Is it turn left or turn right in Doctor Who, where the character takes a choice and you see the whole alternate world. And even my favorite, and there's a featuring this in the book, the other Doctor Who episode where um, the then Doctor Who is being chased around by this, this creature and he lives his life over and over and uh, millions of times mm -hmm. over and over again. And he doesn't he scratch his way through some something in some way. And that, that was apparently based upon the old Sufi myth of what eternity is. And I always loved this line. It's the idea that what is eternity? And the myth said that in the middle of a continent is a huge granite block and it's a hundred miles high by a hundred miles wide. And every hundred years, a bird flies across it. And in the bird's beak is the finest silk you can ever imagine. And it just drags the silk over the top. When that granite block has been worn down 10,000 times, you've picked, you've actually started the first moment of the first second of eternity. And I thought that was brilliant and that's what that was based upon apparently i think these are the areas when you start getting into the concept of time and dilation i think this is where some people get very very uncomfortable um i mean just very very briefly because i'm scared uh, going back into the waking life thing that's very well articulated at the end you know where you're saying you know you go to sleep and it's 8 12 and then you have this long intricate dream that seems to last forever and you wake up and it's like 8 15 it's been like two three minutes and and that's that could be your whole life, you know, those, those 12 to 15 well, that's where I think, after, uh, you die. That's where yeah. I think you can transcend death by entering the dream state eternally because mm. the dream state is timeless and also time doesn't occur in a linear way. It tends to occur or it feels like it occurs in a kind of tapestry. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the Picard Inner Light episode is, as you know, my favourite episode of uh, Star Trek Next Generation. There's also my, the Miles O'Brien episode where he's tortured for 20 years in virtual reality and then comes out and is traumatised for an episode. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking about that one. In, in, that yeah. one is moving. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think with regard to the dreaming, with regard to the headboard incident, one of the things that I reckon with regards to dreaming is that your body's actually constantly taking in information about your surroundings all the time. Yeah. And that, I mean, I know those things from myself from like when my, my daughter was really small, I would hear her call out in a dream and then wake up and she would call out a bit later on. And um, mm -hmm. I think there's an element of time dilation, but there's also an element of your body's actually 
picking up on information all the time. Like say, for example, something's burning in the middle of the night, you may have a dream about a fire and that, that saves a lot of people from house fires and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's even research that I've read. I can't remember where I saw this, but it was something to do with regular lucid dreamers um, tend to have a more developed area of their brain that makes them better at um, hearing during sleep as well, apparently. And actually, that's why I'm really into doing sleep hypnosis, because I think that uh, using sound is one of the most effective tools for incubating and, and getting the kinds of dreams that you want because I mean I used to have my re- my uh, alarm set for capital gold when I was a kid <laughs> and every single morning when I woke up I'd have had this one last lucid dream of like a really actually the the yeah. most popular one was what uh, what was it you've got to be cruel to be kind that was like this weird dream like on a loop record for me because it was always playing on capital gold yeah yeah the one of my favorite things over the years, especially when I was younger, was that when you have either music or or TV, movies of some sort playing in the background and it comes into your dreams. And I used to do that. I used to go to sleep with one of my favorite movies on repeat. And it's a cool little trick to do if you like lucid dreaming, where if you do it enough, eventually it will seep into your dream. And then whoever you are in your dream, you're like, I know this and then you say the next lines and it's in a way that's sort of very magical again in a way it's a very good lucid dream trigger to have that kind of stuff like the song the same song wait on your alarm every day it alerts you to the fact that you're dreaming and then you can wake up in the dream yeah it's fascinating I mean what I was saying about time before Tony I think going back to just a lot of your your main ideas and your work I think this is where some people get very very uncomfortable and about consciousness and how human beings bring you know bring bring existence into existence by 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 observing it and um if you look i've I've said to you over the years so many times if you take for example you know our existence uh the the universe's existence in the big bang theory when people start talking about how everything formed they always said oh for for millions or billions of years all these rocks were flying around and forming planets and this that and the other and then you had the first form of life and da, 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 da. and people say oh it happened over billions of years but unless there was a, a conscious being of some sort bringing it into existence it would have been like that and what i loved about some of the work that your work overlapped with and learning about was it, it's almost like shining a torch into a dark room and what you were saying sir about the concept of time not being linear and and being kind of it's almost like you know uh, circular or overlapping in some way and then it becomes a bit more problematic isn't it when you start to i think some people get very uneasy about it even when einstein said, you know the moon's not there when you don't look at it Mm. it's just i think i saw an article a couple of days ago that said oh you know some scientists believe the future's already happened and i was just like well yeah i mean obviously i mean (laughs) but for some people that kind of thing seems very very terrifying and problematic but it what i always liked about your ideas and and your work was uh i don't recall unless you've gone in a different direction last few books is you were never definitively or arrogantly saying look this is this is the truth and this is the answer it was almost always very you know how about this or if you if you look in in these kind of like in these ways in this perspective it allows you to maybe incorporate this with this and this and you were talking about Richard Wiseman and a lot of the other stuff earlier it's so defeatist it's so counterproductive you just go up oh, no can't can't address that can't look at that so, oh great all right I guess we should all just give up <laughs> exploring it's the, I- it's the idea funnily enough um so I, I spent um a couple of hours talking to um uh, a guy that I really admire a guy called Imran Sparouche Professor Imran Sparouche who um is professor of psychology at one of the universities in Ontario in Canada, I think it's King's University. And he's an unusual character in the sense that he's not only a psychiatrist, a psychologist by training, he's also a mathematician by training. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me a couple of days ago when I was talking that he spent um, two years of his life driving through the snow three nights a week um, to do uh, a postgraduate course in quantum mechanics including the maths of quantum mechanics. And he readily admitted, he said, you know, that he could do about 50 or 60% of the maths, but the rest of it was so complex, he couldn't deal with it. But he was explaining to me and he was saying that, you know, that the way it works is far more complex and also far more simple 
mm-hmm. than we ever understand it to be. What's and partic- the, um, sorry to interrupt. What was the idea you had with time? I, I think you were talking about like to use an example, it was to do with a, a, like a lamp. If you set a lamp to flicker every 60 seconds and every 30 seconds. Yeah, it's, it's called a Thompson's Thoms- lamp. Yeah. And it was put forward, I think, in the late 1950s by a philosopher mathematician called Thompson. It's funny how these things coincide, isn't it? Well, it's this coincidence, isn't it? Is that what well, I hope so? Yeah, yeah. It's like Heisenberg discovered Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. How did Otherwise, he do I've that? just interrupted. It was, you to it, talk was about fate. Like it was fated, wasn't it? He was bound to discover it. Um, but Thompson's lamp, the idea is that there is a lamp that can be switched on and off. I think it's. Uh, it can be switched on, switched on for 10 seconds and off for 10 seconds, then off for five seconds and on for five seconds. Mm-hmm. And it continues breaking down like that. And then the question is, after a certain amount of time, is the light on or off? Mm. And I think what it does in a very clever way, it gets over the, the problems with Zeno's bisection paradox. Because one of the things I argued about in terms of living your life over and over again would be that it would have to be in smaller, smaller pieces of time. And the question is, if you're living in smaller and smaller pieces of subjective time, mm-hmm. but relative to other people, you die. But you're like, I use the analogy in, in Zeno's paradox. I use the analogy. It's, it's, it's my own. But it's a, imagine there's a frog and it lives in the, it lives in the middle of a um, uh, um, uh, uh, what are those plants that float? I, I don't know what the lily other pad. Th- lily pad. That's <laughs> it. It's in a lily pad in the middle of a circular pond. And this frog is a strange frog because it wants to get to the end of the pond to get onto dry land. Yeah. But every time it hops, it's say the six feet for it to get to the end. The first hop it does is three feet. The second hop is one and a half feet and then seven and a half inches or whatever. And every time it bisects by size mathematically that frog will never ever get to the end of it can't ever reach the end of the pond because all the time it's it's in smaller bits of space Mm -hmm. the same analogy can be used for time and the idea that you know every time you 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 live your life again or or every second that you have the next second is half a second then quarter of a second and eighth of a second Mm -hmm. bisection paradox says you will never get there yeah. My argument was, this is what happens with life, that relative to other people, you die. But relative to you and your own subjective period, you don't ever get there. Mm-hmm. But the problem then is, is can you say that time cannot be bisected down to that level? Or is there a point? And David Finkelstein called it the chronon, which is the quantum of time. But I'm now researching material for my new book is going to blow a lot of people's minds because I'm now researching the idea of the quantization of space, the quantization of, of time and the way in which the, and Imre Barus talks about this in his one of his papers, that the universe reality flickers. Reality mm-hmm. isn't 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 um, a continuum. It's it's literally a series of moments that happen and then stop and then there's another moment and stops and another moment and the gaps between uh-huh. are infinite is that to do is, with um sorry so sorry to interrupt is okay. that, is that, it so sounds so similar to something i was fascinated reading about years ago it sounds remarkably similar especially when you get into the science of it so it's, it's got the omega the omega theory what is that tie sounds like zero point, zero point. Um, well, the, well the zero zero yeah. point field the zero point that field is, is yeah is the where energy comes from oh. when you are at just above absolute zero mm-hmm. and if you if you cool down i think it's helium three or helium four down to just just above absolute zero 273.17 degrees minus that or zero kelvin when you get to that what happens is you get what's called superfluidity whereby everything becomes what's called a zero bose constant condensate well, you know, when subatomic particles, when they, are, when they are entangled, they become a single particle. Well, at the zero point field, single particles become almost like lasers. I mean, a laser is a Bose-Einstein condensate that we can see. It's a series of millions of particles that are all reacting in the same way. So they become a singular particle. So the zero point field is argued that it has an ability to actually keep information in, tie in information and create information. And I wrote a book with Irving Laszlo about this a few years ago, because Laszlo's really the expert on the zero point field and zero point information. 
But this is slightly different to that. It's the idea that how reality is understood, whether reality is quantized, because of course the whole point, quantum theory, quantum means package. And it's the idea that as Max Planck said in 1900, that energy is not continual. It comes in tiny packets, which actually solved one of the biggest problems of physics, which was the uh, the ultraviolet catastrophe, which was a big problem in physics in the 1890s. And he argued that it, by coming into packets, it means that you don't have a continual explosion of, of energy because they can't. Then what happened was um, it was then discovered that energy is quantized, but matter is quantized as well in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Max Born that came up with the idea of the quantization of matter and the way in which matter is collapsed by the act of observation, by the act of measurement. Now, if this means that everything is quantized, it means nothing is continual. It's the act of observation that brings about the continuity. And it's only when you go into altered states of consciousness that the mixture of the zero point field, zero point energy, consciousness itself comes together because quantum theory and people can go into denial about this, but they are wrong because they are in denial of it. Quantum physics and the, the Copenhagen interpretation is quite precise. The act of measurement changes a subatomic particle from being a statistical wave function. That is a statistical wave that an object might be here, there or anywhere to a point particle. Now, this is what many movies try to get across. I mean, some of them, for instance, one of the best movies I know, because I'll go off onto quantum physics and we don't want to do that. It's not where we want to go. But one of the best movies I know that brings this into, into perspective is, as I said, um, the, the uh, Inception, mm -hmm. which links into lucid dreaming, leaps and leaks into a lot of the areas there, but also Interstellar. I rewatched Interstellar the other day because I was so um, monumentally disappointed after watching uh, Tenant. I thought it, it was... Sorry for, yeah, I won't, I won't give any spoilers because there's probably a gigantic amount of people that haven't watched that. But uh, What is it called? What is it called, uh, Martin uh, Tennant? Uh, Tennant. Uh, Tennant. It was uh, it's Christopher Nolan's new movie. Oh, right. It was, it was absolutely awful. It was just so boring. Uh, it could have been, like, you know, uh, an inception. It could have been amazing. You know, it seemed, it seemed to assume that you're going to be happy with the, the concept of entropy and the movie just being played backwards over and over. I don't know. It might be worth another watch, uh, another few watches, but... I was in, I was like thoroughly disappointed with how bad it was. But yes, Interstellar, I rewatched the other day, uh, the ending of Interstellar, particularly, you know, the, mm. the, the, the part where he falls behind into that black hole, you know, behind the bookcase and the, the that, Tesseract it, sequence. It, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating. And, um, yeah. Well, so that's the idea, isn't it? Because Nolan, I'd love to have Nolan on the Christopher Nolan on this show because some of the ideas he plays around with are so interesting. And funnily enough, before I forget it, we were talking about J.W. Dunn, and there's mm -hmm. another filmmaker that were, whose work really intrigues me, Gaspar Noy. And Noy did into, I think he did into the into the void. Into the, uh, the, into the, the void, yeah. Into the void. That's correct. And and, and another film he did was called um, Irreversible. And Irreversible is a film that runs backwards, literally. And it's, it's almost like uh, Benjamin Button, you know, like Benjamin Button get, is born old and gets younger and younger and younger. Did you do Memento as well? Memento? Is... No, Memento no. Memento is more fascinating. Memento is a man that has lost his memory, but it does go backwards, doesn't it? That's right. Because he gives himself notes. <laughs> Why am I running? The point makes him feel a bit sick. It gave me travel, like actual travel sickness. Which one, Memento? Enter the Void. Oh, Enter the Void. Oh, okay. Yes, because it's freaky. Whereas just going back to his um, the film um, Irreversible, mm -hmm. it's it's horrific because apparently there's an awful rape in it. I've never actually watched it, but I've been told, you know, it really is quite awful. But the interesting thing is it runs backwards and at the start stroke end of the film, she's in a park, the woman, and she's reading uh, the J.W. Dunn book um, an experiment with time. So there's where the clue is for that. Mm -hmm. And then we have, when we go back to the Tesseract sequence in, um, in Interstellar, of course, that's the idea, isn't it? That, you know, time is impacted within itself and it brings us back to Philip K. Dick and the concept of orthogonal time, which is a time that runs at right angles to this time. And of course, the Philip K. Dick movies, which we can move into. There's oh, so many avenues we can go. Sorry? Minority Report. 
Minority Report. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, Scanner Darkly. Um, and Scanner Darkly is linked later, isn't it? Adjustment you know? Bureau, yeah. I thought, was actually very, uh, it landed in many, many, many areas as well. And then obviously Total Recall and Blade Runner as well. Um, but yeah, it's... Didn't you say you in one of his books? Uh, I've read I've read all of his novels now around that same sort of era. I was enjoying your work, but he, he mentions the uh, the Anarch Peak character, doesn't he, with a, a new revolutionary explanation of of time and and reality. Oh, and the Anarch Peak thing! If people have not heard this, this is um, this is just so weird. It's how weird my life is. Um, many years ago. Um, when I when my first book came out, I did, did a talk at Bolton Library. And when I was giving the talk at Bolton Library, I was talking about is there life after death, it lad and everything. But I had a section on Philip K. Dick as part of my presentation. And as I'm doing it, it was quite a large theatre in, in the library. It was like a theatre rather than a library. And up in the far corner, there was a group of people that started getting agitated. And I thought, this is this is not nice. I'm trying to talk and you're talking to each other. You know, and being an aggressive little scouser, I was going to go up and say, you know, what the, what the hell are you doing? Um, but they afterwards, they came down and they spoke to me and they said, the reason we got excited was a the series of coincidences that brought them to there. And they gave me this whole series of coincidences and chance meetings that had them there that night. And they said, so we were fated to be here. So when you started talking about Philip K. D and they, there was a the whole linkage with Cordoba. There was a whole link with the city of Cordoba, which was. And we've got time to go into it, but it was really bizarre. But anyway, one of the, the guys, Mick, turns around to me and he said, when you were talking about Philip K. Dick, the reason I came to the library today was because I brought back a Philip K. Dick book. And there's the picture of, of the reason why I'm here. And he said, and do you know that Philip K. Dick predicted you? And I went, what? And he yeah. said, yeah, he said he predicted you. And I said, why? And he said, there's a novel he wrote called Counter Clock World. Mm -hmm. And I said, right. And he said, in Counterclock World, there is a character who comes up with a new theory about life after death. And Mick turned around to me, he said, what do you think Philip K. Dick called this character? And I said, I don't know, Fred Bloggs. And he said, no, he called him Anarch Peak. And I went, you're joking. And he said, nope, check the book. That's what he called him. And it was, I uh, checked the book. And yes, it was. But what was weirder was then when I started thinking about this, I, I then ended up writing a biography of Philip K. Dick. Now, we know that Philip K. Dick used to have these hypnagogic dream sequences, and he said he used to see books flying in front of him. Now, I wrote a book on Philip K. Dick. So imagine the scenario that Philip K. Dick is in an out-of-body state, hypnagogic state, and he's looking at bookcases, and he sees a book with his own name on it. A Life of Philip K. Dick, the man who remembered the future. And then he has a glimpse at the name of the person who wrote the book, and he will see a something something peak. And then he comes to and he thinks, I need to write a novel about time travel or whatever. <laughs> and then he subliminally thinks, what shall I call this character? Well, there was that a peak thing. Maybe I'll call him Anarch Peak. Now, whether that's whether that is the way it happened is probably not true. I would like to think so. <laughs> it's just extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's why it's really good to um, use the inspiration and the information that you do encounter in your dreams, just because those scenarios mm. are, make life a bit richer for people later on. They do, but it also shows, doesn't it, that these are our lives. What's happening now is we are all collapsing what I call the egregorial in my new book. I'll really be digging into this idea that we all live with our own, what Charles Pierce called the Phaneron, which is the universe that we're creating all the time. Mm -hmm. But when we overlap with other people, our universes overlap and the universe becomes bigger. And at the moment, the three of us are creating an egregorial world, which is then expanding out to the people who are listening to this yep. in some way, as if there's this kind of magical uber brain. Oh, there'll be something, there'll be a, a bunch of things said today that kind of resonate with somebody that's just like, ah, oh, yeah, that completely, you know, res resonates with, with an experience I've, I've had. It, those memories last with you longer when, when the experience is strange, it's amazing what you remember. 
I remember being at school with um, a guy I haven't spoken to for a very long time now, a guy called Nicky I was in sick form with. And I remember him telling me a story about a dream he had where he went into a, a shop and there was all these football shirts and he, and he pulled back a, a few of these shirts and he found a Gary Lineker shirt and it was spelled incorrectly and he woke up and he was really freaked out by it. And then fast forward 10, 15 years later or whenever it was, and he's on holiday with his dad. He's on, he's, he's in some, uh, for, uh, he's in like Spain or France somewhere. He goes into a shop and he suddenly feels a bit, oh, this feels familiar. And without even thinking about it, just zeroes in, pulls it and, and then was like, oh, look, there's a, and, and yeah, it, it's trivial, but it's also unmistakable and very, very mm. strange. And, and going back to, deja vu i think one of the things i've said to you over the years time and time again the bizarre thing about deja vu in my experience and anytime i've said this other people tend to always agree with me have you ever noticed deja vu is always about trivial stuff it's never mm. massive things it's never anything mm. big it's always well oh, i remember that happening and then you have deja vu about having deja vu you're like oh hang on a minute this has happened before i remember saying that i remember this and then you just kind of spiral off but yeah it's very very strange yeah it, it, it is the, the peculiarity of it because again in our last discussion i think I, I i cited the work of a lady called esther salomon who was a russian psychologist and she wrote an amazing book called um a series of moments and it's about charged memories. And the idea that, it's, that I put forward in my first book is that, that we are in some way recording our lives and downloading our lives onto the zero point field. So every life we live, it's recorded mm -hmm. and it's, it's downloaded and there's levels and levels and each life is recorded in there, which we can then go back and relive. But what intrigued me was why we have these charged memories, why it is there are certain memories of our childhood or through our lives that are really vivid. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a memory of being on Bidston Hill in Birkenhead and no, Thurston Common, looking down and I was a baby and I was in my pram and I could see the bottom of the valley and everything. And it is vivid beyond words, but nothing happened. It wasn't extraordinary in any way, but it's there. And I wonder whether rather like Wilder Penfield argued that we record everything. It's just it's sublimated that the recording mechanism gets super saturated at certain points. And they're the memories that we remember. And it's just random. And is this where deja vu works? Now, again, um, a previous guest on this, on this, on, on my Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour was, was Dr. Arthur Funkhauser. And Funkhauser's dream theory of, of, of um, deja vu is fascinating. And all he argues is that you've recently had a precognitive dream. And you start to live the precognitive dream and you remember, like we do with dreams, you have this vague recollection, which mm. is exactly what Vernon Nepe, in his definition of deja vu, says. It's, it's a memory from an undefined period in your past yeah. that suddenly sums, comes up and wells up and you're living it again. You know. It's, it's very, very strange. I mean, not to, like I say, again, juggle too many different things, but the... Uh, it, it, I don't remember. It is I remember reading uh, Max enjoy Max Tegmark's new book, uh, well, newish, uh, Life 3.0, and and you know obviously even people like Elon Musk, a lot of people about the simulation idea. But is, isn't the theory something along the lines of well, we either intervene and we step in before technology gets to that point, which clearly isn't going to happen, mm. or we blow ourselves up, which is is quite possible, or we get oh, to the yeah. point whether it's 10, 20, 30. 500,000 years in the future where we do get to a point where we can re recreate a simulation. And if that is the case, then, you know, the odds that we're in it, it's, it's, it's very strange. It's very interesting. And I find it, I find it kind of interesting, the, the amount of people, even people on a really trivial level on social media these days, that you know, people that take pictures, selfies, videos, you're, you're uh, increasing the amount of data there is in the universe about you and people that mm. do it a substantial amount, you know, this is all, you're going to be gone one day, arguably the more you, you create, you know, people have this inner like fear and, 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 and need about 
um, you know, immortality, especially celebrities, you know, and, and, and people want to leave something behind where they will always exist afterwards. And, and some people want to put so much of their life onto, onto film. Uh, it, it's very, very interesting. It's very, very strange, isn't it? You know, to do with there's more data on a mm. daily basis now than there was previously before the year of 1990 or something. And like yet, that. and yet, no. the interesting point here is, is if the universe is an enclosed system, mm. which it supposedly is, and we know that data is information, and we know now that information has a physicality to it, mm -hmm. we therefore know that data. And information can never be destroyed. It can only be changed because it's a form of energy. Yeah. We then have the intriguing point of saying that nothing is lost. No. So everything is already encoded. Now, if information is pure digital information, it is non-physical in that way. So the, the latest hypotheses are that, that everything is already encoded on the edge of the expanding universe. Mm -hmm. As the universe expands out, like you're blowing up a balloon, imagine you're in the middle of a balloon that's expanding. On the inside edge of the balloon, there are things that are Planck scale, Planck squares, in fact. Planck scale is the smallest thing you can have, but they're Planck squares. And each one of those Planck squares contains one bit of information. And they've done the calculation, how they've done it, God only knows. But they've said that the amount of information needed to encode the universe is actually contained in the Planck squares at the edge of the universe. Isn't that true of holograms? There's as much information yes. in like the corner of a hologram as there is in the entire hologram. Correct. If you, if you take a holographic picture and you smash it up, mm. what you will get is a denuded image of the whole hologram. Now, this is again what David Bohm argued. It is what Carl Pribram argued. It's the idea that our brains are holographic and we are processing a holographic universe. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you want to really know about this work, Craig Hogan at the Perimeter Institute, who funnily enough is somebody that's known by Im Imran Barouche that I was talking to last week because we were talking about this. And he said, no, I actually know Craig Hogan. I might try and go around and see him because I mentioned this to him. And he said, I need to go there to find this out because he wasn't aware of this. Yeah. Now, Hogan is looking for the, the imprint of the data. They're trying to look for the pixelation of space. Now, if that is the case, this is a simulation is the wrong word. But it's not what we think it is. It's based on information. And again, I say to people, don't take my word for this. Go and read the work of people like um, Vladko Vadrell, one of the young up and coming quantum physicists. And we know our mutual friend Marcus Chown and the work he does. Mm. You know, clearly this is important. And Brian Clegg is another person that I, I absolutely adore in terms the of science writing. Oh, I really enjoyed reading that book years ago with Marcus. Wasn't Chown. it great? It was really nice to meet him. He's such a lovely guy um, over the years. Yeah, because he. I'm so sorry. Far, sorry, I'm so far removed. Obviously, I, I admit to not understanding the, the maths and the science to a large degree. But when I was having this type of thought and conversation recently about all these types of areas, you know, when people are constantly trying to explain why the universe is expanding at a faster rate and, and uh, along those lines, and I'm like, well, surely it's to do with data. Mm. You know, the amount of data that's being generated from our world now, and the more that we carry on in the current state that we are, the more people that are being born and the more technological devices that are being created. I mean, is there a, a is there a link there? Like, is there a connotation mm. between the amount of data that we generate every day as human beings and the way that the world's expanding? I don't know. I mean, I, I just thought it was a curious uh, idea. I could be way off. <laughs> just definitely <laughs> one flat. Well, when you think about it, this discussion now, you know, it's being it's being digitized. It's 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 already out there. Mm. It's expanding out into space at the speed of light, uh, which isn't a great distance over a period of time. But nevertheless, it's already out there. And I think your point really made me think then my generation, you know, I'm in my mid 60s now. I have no video or film of my, myself as a child, mm. nor do I have anything other than old photographs. And they were only occasional. Whereas this generation now, you know, we've got videos of ourselves, we've got films of ourselves to the minutia of our lives. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly say, th th it's almost imprinting ourselves upon the universe yep. in some way that the, somebody could, by taking all that data, mm -hmm. recreate us. I mean, for instance, I'm fascinated now. I've been interested in virtual reality for quite a few years and I had a Dell headset for a few years, but I've now got the new Oculus headset. 
Mm-hmm. And some of the, the, the virtual reality meeting groups is only a matter of time before somebody's going to come up with a way of digitizing you, how you look yeah. by scanning you yeah. and then having you as your own avatar in a virtual reality simulation. Well, I saw that they're already doing a virtual reality experience where people can meet loved ones, like their deceased loved ones, and have a virtual reality interaction with them. Wow. Tell me more. How is that? How does that work? I think that's just about it. But, you know, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that virtual reality, I think, is going to change. It's going to kind of evolve our consciousness a bit because as media changes and as culture changes, our dreams and our ideas and thoughts about reality change. And I think that the experience of virtual reality is very different from looking at a TV screen or looking at your phone. And if we get into that being our usual mode of absorbing information, um, the world is going to start looking very different. Was it you that posted something about when they do an MRI scan or an fMRI scan of somebody that's working in virtual reality, the different parts of the brain fire up? as well was it you no but we were talking about i can't remember who we were talking to about people that play a lot of virtual reality games are often into lucid dreaming because i've had the experience myself like i lucid dream a lot but when i had a go on virtual reality for the first time i did have that feeling of like oh this is what it feels like being in in a lucid dream and when you lucid dream a lot you're more likely to lucid dream because you're familiar with that state and that awareness so i think that virtual reality is something that could actually be really good because we've spoken before as well about how i really think that our way of looking at the world these days is all to do with looking at screens and flat surfaces and we don't Mm -hmm. have that gazing through space exploring an environment we don't use our eyes in that way as much as we used to and actually with virtual reality we would be going back to that kind of gazing into the obsidian mirror way of looking Mm -hmm. at stuff Martin, what's your thoughts on that? It's interesting because as Sarah was just telling that story, I remember it was about a year ago, I was having a period of time where I was conscious of the fact I was using my phone and my laptop and and basically doing way too much on screens. And I had an insanely large amount of burnout. And I had one of those strange coincidences where there was a, a lecture and a talk that I'd signed up for maybe even almost a year before. Um from a, a lady who was talking about a uh, digital um, uh, distraction and, and how we all spend way too much time on, on our phones and, and, and little tips you can have. And it, and it pops up like by pure coincidence, but yeah, no, I completely, completely agree. It's, 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 it's very, very strange. Um, I mean, even I think with the habit of binge watching stuff on mm, Netflix, like yeah. so many people do that now. And when I think about, I don't really watch TV. I watch Star Trek. <laughs> and I, I think yeah, yeah, I did get to <laughs> Babylon Five for a bit, but for the most part, I hardly watch anything ever. And um, I'm really into reading, and actually, I think reading novels, especially because there's something about reading like imaginative works that mm-hmm. activate your imagination. So I find if I read a novel before I go to bed, then I'll likely dream some of the stuff from that book. So it's important to not read The Collector by John Fowles before you go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> not as a woman, no, definitely not. Not as anyone ever. Apparently, there's a, a very big difference in your brain between reading an actual physical book and actually reading a, a Kindle and the way that you process mm. to do with the light and yeah. the actual the, the space uh, on a page. Um, I, I'm butchering it. I can't remember the exact explanation, but yes, it's a noticeable difference. And it, I, I'm not somebody that's ever gone with a Kindle. I enjoy reading the book as well. And, and yes, I've started to like take up well, enjoy drawing again more recently in the last like few months. Uh, I've noticed your drawings are superb, by the way. I, I can copy about things. Drawing. Drawing's amazing. Like I used to draw all the time and I've been, I, what I did get into is um, d- drawing hieroglyphs with ink and uh, ink and a reed pen. Mm. And it was so, it was like meditating. And I realized like how much mm. I hadn't enjoyed drawing for such a long time. And it, it used to be something I used to do all the time before the internet. <laughs> Took, took the words out of my mouth is is I've been explaining that to friends a lot recently because I've started doing it a lot like over lockdown over the last few months or almost every other night and people go oh why are you enjoying it so much and I'm like it's a form of meditation it's a zen state because I put on some chill music and I sit there and three or four hours pass by 
where my brain has not had a single internal thought. There's no anxiety, there's no stress, there's nothing at all. And then you get to enjoy that exact moment when you realize you're done and you've created something. And there's something really, it is a, it, it's, it's as good as yoga or something. Well, maybe I'm uh, going to cause some problems there having done that and enjoyed that too. But yes, it is a, it's a meditative state where you just switch your brain off. And I think it's, um, I've noticed because I can copy very well. I can't, I can't, I wouldn't be very good. I've done a few, but I, I'm very good at copying pictures. I could copy a, a pitch very, like very, very well. And I've noticed the more I've been doing that recently, before I go to bed, I've been like seeing shapes and things and a lot more than I used to. And it's almost like my brain's learning how to be a lot, lot more creative. Yeah, um, I think that that is something that you can develop, like exercise, creativity and imagination. And I think yeah. when people do switch off their devices and have like a digital detox, even for a day these days, I actually think that digital detox is going to be like the new trend, like Wim Hof breathing or something where, <laughs> you know, that it's all free, the sea's free, air's free, imagination's free. And actually yeah. we're better off with those things because they're more natural and they're more um, harmonious with our nature. Well, without, Again, going on to a, a gigantic segue, I won't. I'll keep it at 15 seconds. I had chronic, uh, chronic, chronic problems with eczema and allergies and stuff for 20, 25 years to, to levels you would not believe. And then seven, almost eight years ago, not through Wim Hof, way before it was a craze, I discovered almost gradually my own intuition, cold showers. I've been taking them every day for almost eight years now. And in between that and having a better ability to deal with life and anxiety i've 95 percent remission i've no no issues generally now because of that so yeah yeah it's um i remember hearing something from a, a very clever sort of uh, eastern philosophy the further away you get from nature the the more sick you're going to be and the yeah. more you depend on products and things it's like oh have you tried this cream well i'm like why you're gonna need it forever it's clearly not gonna work like you, you know you need yeah i'm i'm fingers crossed it's um a sunny enough day for sea dipping in the sea on christmas day because i love a sea dip oh okay uh i know a guy called he's a dj famous guy in well i'm ish a guy, guy in a, a fellow comedian in brighton called guy lloyd who's a member of the a sea dipping community who you may know uh, I've done it a few times, but not as regularly as those guys do. <laughs> I see them out there regularly. I don't go in if it's rough. I like it to be uh, still, but I'll go in at any temperature. I don't mind the cold. I just, I think it's an act of adoration of the mm. element, which I enjoy. Yeah, very, very good for you. Yeah, 100%. Um, and yeah, you will see a backlash to the point because people are so burnt out and so just like what you were saying before with 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 social media and like dating i i was 10 15 years ago i'm you know somebody that was capable of having 15 conversations at once but you get to the point where you're like i don't want to do this and and it's the same people have that kind of emotional regurgitation of like negative things where you're just telling the same story over and over and over and over to different people and you're like why what's the point of this there's nothing unique or organic about this and yeah that's that's a big problem i think with dating i think people are pulling back on that for that exact reason as well well covid's yeah. put the kibosh on internet dating for a lot of people <laughs> i'm not taking any more sober walks with people there's, a, <laughs> like, there's, there's something to be said for sitting in a bar and have a drink with somebody but yes you know uh, there's nothing wrong with one or two uh, but yeah it's, it's a weird time to be dating uh, i won't disagree with that certainly we well, discussed does, about three movies today, by the way. <laughs> you're right. Okay. No, this this was the whole point of Incon. This is why we. This is why Sarah and I do it. This yeah. is not. We have a basic theme, but we just go off. Um, because I think what we're doing is, I mean, Sarah and I, you know, we're part of a group that tried to meet rather like the the uh, Walker group and everything mm. in Liverpool, and what we tried to get going in in West Sussex as well, is that you know there's a need for us to share ideas and thoughts in this way because it, it it's so important you know effectively the most i think probably the both of you will agree with me that you know with probably less exception with sarah in the, the world i mix in normally i don't talk about these things you know you don't because people switch off you can see their little eyes go up in their head and they think well, i'm not interested in this and again imran and i were discussing this 
as to why it is that certain people all this clicks with massively. It's the only time I feel alive when I have these conversations. I'm the complete opposite. This is yeah. when I'm actually yeah. a person, like, yeah. dead when I'm not do doing it. I can't talk thing at all. Like, this is why I've never had a job, because I can't do a job. Oh, I can't do normal talk. conversations. People start talking to me sometimes, and I go, like, practically <laughs> cross-eyed, where I just can't be bothered to listen to them. This is and, uh, yeah, like, and like you say... I like to go in at the deep end immediately with people just to work out where you are because I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I'm just saying I can't stand generic conversations. Is that like you say the office kind of, the, 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 you know, I have a sickness, or if I'm giving somebody a, a, a card for their birthday, I'm wishing somebody a. I, I can't just say to so and so da da da. From I'll have to say something bizarre and different. I can't say the obvious and generic, and it's been a problem. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a good thing. But like you say, you it's a way of filtering out people. It either resonates with people or it eliminates people. And you go, yep, we're, we have absolutely nothing in common. Nothing yeah, I think there's just, they're sort of developed over the last few years, I've noticed, a real people-pleasing culture. And I mm -hmm. tend to be quite the opposite. A lot of people will be like, Sarah's really rude when you first <laughs> not like, good, I'm glad you think that because yeah. then you won't want to talk to me. <laughs> I could not be more the same. I'd say probably 90% of my closest best friends hated me when they first met me and they got to know me and went, oh, he's just kidding. He's not so bad. Da, 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 da. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's this, yeah, it's, it's this inert like need to, to connect and have something authentic rather than like you say, the generic well, not... we've only got so much time. Well, if you argue it, yeah, lad, you go back again and again. But yeah. the thing is, life is too short. You And the thing is, you want to suck in other people's ideas. You want, mm -hmm. you know, we've all read lots of things and it's only by talking to people. And somebody will say to me, do you know what? I, you, do you know about this? And I'll go, no, I don't. And I'll go out and I'll read it. But the whole rest of the world seems to be just talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're not learning anything. If you're talking, you're not learning. Whereas what we're trying to create with this and what our various groups are trying to create is this kind of really open-ended, let's just talk about things. And this is why, you know, when we did the event last year, <laughs> we keep going on about this bizarre event we did last year in, in uh, the Plato's Cave event. Drake Close But it was wonderful because they were just... hilarious. <laughs> Drake Close Tunnels. Because uh, it was... It was... Bad, wasn't it? I mean, this it is was, the thing, and like, the hotel we stayed in was just that was the fa my favorite part. Might have been the hotel we stayed in. I mean, I find that kind of thing just hilarious and joyful. It was literally the worst hotel in England. It was so good. There was rats scurrying <laughs> up on my above my much, ceiling. Much better story than if you just checked into a regular hotel and nothing exactly. happened. That's yeah. Exactly. Well, I always have thought that. I guess, like I've often seen my life as uh, just a series of hilarious stories to tell people so sometimes when really well, awful stuff happens i just think oh i can't wait to tell mom and dad this or whatever well, you know. when when i was about 18 i was working in a nightclub uh in the, where i'm from from calling the southeast called brannigan's and there was a girl i i was so so into so in love and and we had the most amazing conversation one day and she said to me i think you meet people you learn what you can from them and then you move on. And because I liked it so much at the time, I was like, no, you meet someone you like and you hold on to them forever. But <laughs> gradually over the like next five, 10, 15, 20 years, generally my whole life, it's been a back and forth on that where I, I, I do agree. Uh, and it takes a while, depending on what kind of childhood and what kind of uh, person you are, how emotionally aware you're and attached you are. It used to upset me when I was younger, where I'd have those amazing moments with a stranger on a train where you have an amazing conversation with somebody for an hour and then they just get up and go, well, see you later, goodbye. And then they just leave and you're like, what are you doing? I'm never going to speak to you ever again. And then gradually over the years, I, I learned the beauty of that. And, and one of my favorite phrases to this day, when I, I say goodbye to somebody, I know I'm never going to see again is have a great life. And just, you know, you can either embrace that kind of um, awareness or or you you struggle with it and and there is something magical about those moments that you have with somebody and i think yeah some people are more keen to connect with other people i mean i'm i'm a terrible consumer all of my money gets spent on food drink and traveling that's literally the only thing that i i care about which is why you know these last nine months has been <laughs> quite difficult for me for somebody who lives on their own but um 
the concepts behind Tony's ideas and like I say, the, the coincidences and synchronicities and people we used to meet and the, the places it used to take us um, 10 years ago and even still now. I, I remember, Tony, I come to see your, your, your uh, talk. Was it about a year ago you did? Um, where it was quite close. Was it somewhere in Hayward's Heath or Burgess Hill? It was. It was in, Hay it was in Burgess Hill, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, just, just the same sort of amazing kind of coincidences and stories popping up. I mean, you had access, didn't you, during the, the JW Dunn work that you did, where you were given access to all these huge amount of stories that people had written in about. Am I confusing that with something else? No, no, you're not. You're, not, you're quite right. Way back, uh, round about... Oh, did you come to my event at the National Theatre where I did... I don't think I did. Oh, but, okay. But I know when I, the woman with the birth control and the voices and the, the drug that would have killed her and those sorts of things, all these crazy stories that you had access to. Oh, totally. Because what, what happened was I was given access. I was, um, I became, I was going to be do, do a, 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 um, an event at the National Theatre. I was invited to speak before a performance of Time in the Conways by J.B. Priestley. Um, and I met J.B. Priestley's son, Tom who was the guy that was responsible for the um, dueling banjos in Deliverance. So there's a movie line there. And he actually won, um, he, was, he, was, he won an Oscar for the sound of, of Deliverance, the movie, uh, which is an aside, really. Um, but he was telling me that when his father um, died, they found a load of letters underneath his, his bed, which were the letters that were sent to him in 1962 when he appeared, he appeared on a monitor TV program with Hugh Weldon. And at the end of the programme, um, uh, Priestley had said to, the, to Hugh Weldon that he was researching a book on time anomalies and precognitions and everything for, in preparation for his book, Man and Time. And Hugh Weldon turned to the TV audience and said, if you've had any extraordinary experiences, please feel free to write into the BBC and we'll forward your letters to, um, to Mr. Priestley. Now, these were the letters he found. Now, he used about 10 or 12 of them for his, uh, his book, Man and Time, but the rest of them were forgotten. There were 3,000 of them. And I was given an opportunity to, to go and um, look at these letters uh, at the, the documents library at the University of Cambridge. And I spent a week there going through, and I got through about eight or 900 of them. And they're extraordinary. They're absolutely extraordinary. Now, in my book on J.B. Priestley, Time and the Rose Garden, um, the last two chapters are about the books, about the, the letters. But I am planning to write a complete book just on the letters. And I'm in negotiations with an American publisher at the moment to do this because I think there's a whole book here because some of the experiences were absolutely extraordinary. You could make a movie. Yeah out of just some of the letters. The best ones have never been told. They're out there for people that just don't share them with people. And, but, and this is the important point, isn't it? Yeah. That people do not share their extraordinary experiences. And there's so many of them yeah. that, you know, when scientists turn around and say, there's not enough evidence for this. The evidence is everywhere. It's just I people don't talk about it. we have this drive to share it, like where we have this need to just get it out there because not everybody has that. We're almost like overcompensating for the people that don't want to talk about it. Yeah. I wonder whether this um, like recent lockdown situation with everyone using the internet, perhaps slightly differently to the way they were using it pre-COVID, might mean that we're using it for better purposes now. And a lot of people mm -hmm. are embarking upon these kind of self-improvement missions at the moment. And I, I do think there does seem to be this kind of atmosphere of people really trying to make the most out of stuff because people are starting to realize that their time is limited and so they do want to learn and they do want to improve themselves and they do want to be the best version of themselves and so I think that you know really everything that we see on the media is a response to what the makers of media think that we want so we have we have the opportunity to kind of direct that into the things that we want to learn about and the things that we want to be of cultural importance and I think these things are really culturally important like millions of selfies and fluffy lined leggings not very important like the amount of shit that's sold online now is kind of amazing we must be reaching saturation point with it mm -hmm. like i was just looking the other day like wish.com's actually just become a complete joke with how ridiculous all the items are but like the other day i saw being advertised this like spray foam that you can just spray over the roof of your house to stop 
like tiles from leaking and kind of think how much more rubbish can we produce as a culture like surely we want to be looking after ourselves and nature should at least be seen as being an important and critical part of our lives you know there's lockdowns shown us that if nothing else surely um you know when you see stuff like the hs2 still going ahead you realize that a lot of the people in power obviously don't have this idea so it's it's kind of up to people now we have a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for and we need to direct culture the way we want it to be directed well yeah well, i was going to say that you know when i was talking to him around last week he, he was making the point and he said I, I i i believe quite sincerely that the reason we are communicating is now because we are fated to and that the, there is a need for change and change can only be done by people like ourselves joining together in the way we are doing you know for instance within our world of research at the moment i get very frustrated that there's so much wacko stuff out there there's you know conspiracy theories and god knows what else that's really destroying in many ways the 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 the, the objective work that we try to do to come to terms and understand these phenomena in as structured a way as we possibly can. And I think that's why we're all being attracted to each other because we're all, and again, as Imran said to me, and it's a thing I've used all the time, we feel that we're on a bridge and there's the wackos on one side who believe anything. And then there is the deniers who won't believe anything at all. And we're in the middle and both of them are throwing things at us and we're going, no, 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 for God's sake, you know, this is important. You know? I agree well, more. It's, it, it's the, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, you see it so much on because the stuff that I do with the Explorers Club. I mean, since lockdown, I've taken the Explorers Club online, and I've been delivering it. I've been delivering the information or the research or the things that I'm interested in in the way that um, I am. I absorb information, which is I'm open minded to everything. I don't rule anything out, but I'm also quite like a critical thinker. So I think about the options that are out there. But when you watch something like Netflix, for example, will have a really kind of dry documentary about discovering a tomb because I do a lot of Egyptology stuff and then ancient aliens and there's nothing in between. There's no one that's just like, let's talk to this ancient alien person and see what they think. And then let's explore that, break that apart and see where no one does that. And, you know, there's got to be room for some inspiration and intuition without being completely um, thinking that everything's got to be down to aliens or some or psychedelic drugs. Do you know what I mean? Life is not that simple. It's the problem with the spectrum, isn't it? And I think the the COVID, the, the COVID thing, and I'm so glad it hasn't come up too well at all. And so now we don't really need to go into it at all, but it's a good illustration of you like you said you're either you're either here or you're here there's no one's allowed to be here anymore and it's the perfect illustration for all forms of discussion in the world now is that i mean this is where i would consider myself i am not a crazy wacko conspiracy theorist but i'm also not a sheep that's just going to accept anything anybody tells me there's room for you to exist in a place where you go well how about we just question things because that in itself brings you to the central theme of everything we've been discussing today which is what can you ever actually really know on a macro level? Everybody's so cocksure of themselves. So many people I know who are rational, lovely, nice people. But I say, look, I'm not taking the side of conspiracy theorists, but do you understand that you don't know? You could be wrong. I'm not saying yeah. you are, but that's, you might be. And that's right, what that's we need it. to come to terms with. Yeah, it is a cultural trend at the moment for this division. And that hasn't always been the case, but it does seem to be across the board, whether mm. we're talking about ancient aliens and scientists or yeah. COVID and COVID deniers or left and right politics. It mm-hmm. seems to be the trend culturally that there is no... Room for being in the middle and being like. Well, I think I think what's happened is that Dunning Kruger is running rampant now as well. You know the concept that you don't know what you don't know. And I was thinking this a couple of days ago. The Dunning Kruger effect affects us all. We all don't know what we don't know. We all don't know the level of our own ignorance. But some people are willing to learn and some people are willing to investigate and read but not investigate and read the things that you feel at ease with the danger i think with the with the internet at the moment and with everything else is that people around the world can focus in on their little bugbears and they can find other people that have the same crazed ideas as they have and they feed upon themselves 
And in feeding upon this information, they then get themselves into a real tiz about it all. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'd like to believe that our groups, because we have, dare I say, not necessarily highly intelligent people, but very well, well, well read people mm -hmm. who invest time in reading. And because we are all mature enough to listen to each other's ideas, yeah. You know, and I always argue when I do my presentations, I will say, I don't know I'm right. If you come forward and you point out to me where I'm in error, I'm yeah. happy to accept that. I think that's the thing. It's about being genuinely curious, isn't it? And I was having this conversation the other day just before I did like um, an interview with one of the Egyptologists. We were having a little kind of like chat beforehand and um, we were talking about the ancient alien phenomena and he was saying to me that he's tried to have conversations with them, but they just won't have it. Like that some of the ancient alien people at least will say that Egyptologists can't read hieroglyphs, which must make Egyptologists like really frustrated. And um, he was saying to me that, uh, you know, or I, I said that I think that what I find interesting about ancient alien theorists, if it's really their thing, like it's literally their life's work to uncover the truth about the pyramids, wouldn't they want to learn hieroglyphs so they at least know as much as Egyptologists? But the fact that they don't make that effort, or most of them don't, and he was actually telling me that he's met a couple that started off ancient aliens, learned hieroglyphs, and then kind of had to change their minds about stuff. So um, so I find that quite interesting. And I guess that's the thing, is I'm really curious. I want to know the truth. Like Madame Blavatsky says, there's no religion higher than truth. And I don't think that you have to stick to your narrative and you get this situation now i guess where people think they're really investigating or getting into stuff by but the mode of investigating and researching is by typing what you want to find out on google and not anything else whereas in the past you'd have to go to a library and get books that would display all kind of you know more more thoroughly researched and more different points of view on the same subjects nowadays you just google what you want and then that comes up so that's all you're going to find there's there's pre-created opinions so you don't go into the construction of those opinions in the first place and help to form them you you like you say you just type in da 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 yep yeah, somebody's already taken care of all the hard work for you and so you don't have to think about a single thing i mean tell you years, years years back back in the forum days uh there was an overlap with uh, graham hancock wasn't there and obviously he's written a lot about that sort of area yeah, there was. I mean, Graham and I did a couple of events together um, a few years ago. Uh, we did a big event at Swindon, as I recall. Um, and I have a great deal of admiration for Graham Hancock. Uh, and indeed, had the lockdown not taken place, um, definitely this summer, um, Graham and I were going to be doing an event together in uh, in Southern California, um, uh, in the Contact in the Desert. And again, I'm intrigued in terms of the whole contact in the desert thing, because a lot of the ancient alien guys, I'll have the opportunity to have discussions with in terms of this, because I know that the ancient alien group are part of all that. Um, uh, there's the uh, Greek guy that's on it a lot. Oh, um, yeah, he's great. The one that's in all the memes. Yes, yes, him, because uh, he's he would have been, had I done it last year, he would have been on a, um, a, a panel with me. I love watching Ancient Aliens. I think it's really fun. But what I think would be great is if they had some ancient alien people, some Egyptologists, and maybe some other types of people as well, <laughs> all talking about it together without having a fight. Because why can't people do that anymore? I can I totally know. have an, a conversation yeah. with someone that I massively disagree with without shouting and insulting them. Yeah, why wouldn't you? That's the problem. And it's it fun. Is. It's fun, and it's dynamic, and it's the art of conversation to to debate things. Well, this is the whole point of the academic world. You know, the academia. You know, the idea of of you discuss ideas and you debate ideas and you choose to differ. But the the whole thing should be that you're you should be willing to go into that, knowing that your opinion may change. And mm. I think the problem is with a lot of writers these days is they start from a belief. And then they investigate the information they need to support their belief. Whereas when I wrote cheese, when I wrote my first book, I didn't know where I was going to go with that. Mm. The information was what took me to the conclusions. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to come up with a concept of life after death. That wasn't my starting point. I was trying to explain deja vu, you know. And 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 this is what's important. This is why I find our group so exciting, and this is why I find this particular platform we're using now 
is going to fly. We're going to really be really doing some extraordinary things on this platform. Of that, I am absolutely sure. You know, with guests like Martin and everybody else, you know, we, I mean, it's a classic example now, isn't it? We've gone off away from movies and we've had the most fascinating discussion. I kind of assume we would, to be honest. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it usually is the case. I mean, the movies are the vehicle for, for the actual conversation question anyway, and, and generally always are. I mean, the, the, the movies we, we could have been talking about today, obviously Groundhog Day, um, 1201, which is a very similar sort of sci-fi-ish Groundhog Day kind of theme. And then I always enjoyed 12 Monkeys and the way yeah. I handled the idea and the, the loop of... I was going to say Pinter. Brazil. I like Brazil, which oh, is yeah. not necessarily a time thing, but you do have that alternate reality at the end, which mm. some people take as being really tragic and I always think is really beautiful at the end of Brazil. I love it. It yeah. would be interesting to try and get Ch Terry Gilliam on this show because I have a mutual contact with Terry in that there's a guy called Tony Grissoni and Tony Grissoni was the guy who um, wrote the script for fear and loathing in Las Vegas, the Johnny Depp movie. And there's a really interesting link here because Tony contacted me about my work and we met up, we had a wonderful lunch together and he was telling me about the, how complex it was writing the, the movie script for that. Mm -hmm. And he, he turned around to me and again, it's how the world works. And he turned around and he said, he said, I was brought in uh, to the movie because the previous script writer fell out with, um, with Gilliam or whoever. Um, and I had to rewrite it all, but he still gets the credits for that. And I said, is that Alex Cox? And he said, yes, it is. How did you know that? And I said, because I went to school with Alex Cox. And literally four days ago, I was swapping emails with Alex and he mentioned his involvement with that. So that within two days, two people who are both involved in a movie that I'd not thought about and I've never actually seen it. I don't mm -hmm. think I might have seen it. I might have seen it because of the DMT sequences, but really intriguing. So it would be good to try and get Terry Gilliam on because I've always wondered what, what's he doing in the monkeys movie? You know, because there's the time slip, there's the going forwards and backwards in time. There's the idea that people, when they're insane, is because they're actually trying to deal with things that normal people can't deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, and that final sequence with the shooting on the escalator at the airport, incredible filmmaking. But as you said, um, Time Bandits, what a movie that was. You know, that he, he is ex an extraordinary filmmaker with amazing imagination. Jabberwocky. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen Jabberwocky? I was going to say that's some of the children's stories because I think children's stories were the things that first affected my my kind of um, my taste in terms of art and film and culture. And my favourite book as a kid was Alice in Wonderland. And the Doctor Zeus story, Horton Hears a Who, is has that element of um, I don't know reality only having a certain amount of sphere of influence because you've got the whole world on a speck of dust on a flower that Horton picks up and he's the only person that can hear them. So they don't really exist, but they do exist. And then you have the kind of macrocosm and the microcosm. So I always loved children's stories and Alice in Wonderland. I always thought, I still think to this day is the best kind of creative expression of what a lucid dream actually feels like. Very interesting. Very interesting. Right, guys, I'm aware of time and we've gone over for two hours and 14 minutes, which is absolutely extraordinary. And as Sarah yeah. and I says every time, you know, where did the time go? As Sandy Denny once, who knows where the time goes, as the beautiful Sandy Denny fan once sang for Fothering Day, I think it was. I don't think it was Fairport Convention. I think it was Fothering Day. And if anyone has to check that track out, it's absolutely beautiful. But that's an aside. Sarah, would you like to make a quick point about your, your event tomorrow, um, just so that people who are watching this might be driven towards that? Yeah, so tomorrow the Explorers Club is talking to Samantha, mine and Anthony's mutual friend, Samantha Treasure, about sleep paralysis. So um, Sam is currently studying uh, in the areas of medical anthropology. So she's going to be talking about it from a kind of cultural and uh, psychological, but also personal, because I know Sam has a lot of um, sleep paralysis experiences perspective, and we're going to be able to ask her questions. And because she's living in Korea at the moment, that's going to happen at 11 a.m. UK time tomorrow. Oh, it's 11 a.m. That's 11 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I might try and look <laughs> I mean, at least that. it won't give you nightmares, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, good. I mean, so if I was going to say, the, the, I was hoping they'd make a lot more movies about sleep paralysis and, and this streaming. The only movie I ever saw that they made about sleep paralysis was a couple of years ago. It was just absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I think it was even just called sleep paralysis, but it was just, 
yeah, just a bunch of people getting killed while they were falling into it. But had a lot of references to the old hag syndrome and a lot of the areas mm. that that touches on. But yeah, probably an application of Freddy Krueger, maybe even. Yeah, it, it was very, very similar to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think Freddy Krueger did kind of traumatize a generation of kids with regards to. I remember it even being an urban myth in my teenager years to that if you died in a dream, you died in real life. Mm. I always heard that. I remember hearing that from a lot of people. It's one of those things where you hear and you're like, oh, that's the truth. Why? I don't know. Somebody's going to tell me <laughs> Right. Terrific. Oh, well, well, absolutely fantastic discussion, as always. Um, everybody, this will be, I will record this tomorrow and put it up probably onto my YouTube site later, probably tomorrow afternoon or maybe on Wednesday. Um Martin, thank you very much um, for a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, and as always, Sarah, thank you very much for your involvement, because without you, we couldn't be doing it. And again, we need to do this again. Um, this is just but the start and we need to get you back. And we need because we didn't even scratch the surface of the areas we wanted to go. But I did expect that. OK, thanks very much, everybody. And if um, thank you're you. not, nice not, to meet you, Martin. Yeah, no, you too, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Tony. It's really nice to, to even just see you in a and chat again and i'm glad yeah as as usual we wasn't sort of short of uh short of things to talk about um we never all which was probably not likely but no really really enjoyed it and yeah so really nice to meet you and yeah thanks again good okay thanks everybody and we'll see you again probably now um we, we'll take a break for two weeks and then we'll be back in the new year with uh, another show okay thanks very much see you guys, guys bye bye, bye. bye.